Good morning, everyone, here in this room and out there in cyberspace. My name is Michael Hurek. I'm the director of the Brussels office of DAD, and I welcome you here for this conference, Team Europe for Higher Education in Emergencies. Sorry for starting a little bit late, but on-site and online participation is not necessarily synchronous. So we have to improvise a little, but I hope that we will be able to maintain our time schedule. Now, I don't know whether you saw that headline two weeks ago, um, which said in science business, we need bullets, not grants. I found that statement terrible and frightening, and I don't know whether you um, think the same, probably you do, but it is to some extent true for the situation in Ukraine, and it's definitely true in other crisis situations. Because when bombs fall and rockets fly, higher education and research is no longer possible. And once proud institutions of higher learning are nothing more than ashes and rumble, and those that have dreamt of becoming top scientists, young students, researchers, are left to defend their country, their community, or they had to flee to another place where they're in safety. So basic survival is on the agenda and not the next breakthrough in science and innovation. And I think that's heartbreaking. We're talking about higher education in emergencies today, and I would like to describe it as an attempt to fix something that shouldn't have been broken in the first place because it's the second best option that we provide higher education in emergencies, um, because the best option would be to have a good higher education system in a safe environment in that country, um, which is no longer possible. Luckily, though, we do have countries that are very engaged in providing higher education in emergencies. They provide light in the darkness, they provide safe harbor. Countries like Jordan, Turkey, uh, Lebanon have been very in the Syrian crisis. Countries like Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, um, all of the European Union is currently engaged in providing assistance in the Ukraine crisis. And slowly, I think it's being acknowledged that terrorism crisis, refugee crisis need a higher education response. It's not just enough to cater for secondary and primary education, which is important because education of schools is important, but we need to work on providing solutions in higher education. And yet every new crisis catches us with surprise. We all start to scramble and what happens, and maybe it's because we can't imagine um, this will happen, you know? that war is too dreadful to think about, uh, that you are not willing to provide like crisis plans uh, for the case that something terrible like the situation in Ukraine happens. Sometimes, when we're lucky, actors like the European Union or the member states, they provide support, like the MADAT Fund did in the framework of the Syrian crisis. We're very grateful for that. And I think this seminar today is a good occasion also to look back and see what did we learn from the experiences of the MADAT Fund, from our engagement in Syria, in Lebanon, to support um, Syrian students um, that are studying in neighboring countries. But the question is, can we come up with a um, holistic framework, maybe, that enables a flexible reaction for terrible situations such as the war in Ukraine? So can we imagine our frameworks to be uh, in such a way installed that they would be able to adapt quickly, something that we're trying to do with Erasmus Plus at the moment. Um, but maybe we need other types of instruments um, to be more effective as the European Union, as its member states. So I would like to thank you all for following our invitation here today um, and joining that conversation because I think it's a, a necessary conversation. Now, before we dive into the different sessions here. Um, let me explain a little bit about the background of the seminar. First of all, the title. High Education for Emergencies, Team Europe, question mark. Titles are never chosen by coincidence, right? Titles are 
the essence of, of each seminars and finding the right way to address it is, is usually one of the hardest things to do. Team Europe is a powerful concept coined by the European Union. And one could argue it's currently being underutilized. We don't know yet what it actually means in practice. And we all need to discuss what it could mean uh, in reality. So the question is, how can we work together as a team? Member states, European Union, other institutions. But also, how do we include neighboring countries, non-member states, that actually are very engaged in providing higher education in emergencies? So what do we do with Moldova? or Jordan, or Turkey? Can we coin Team Europe as an inclusive concept? That means we're working together with everyone that wants to work on a peaceful world? I hope so. Because in a global gateway strategy of the European Commission, it was underlined that international cooperation in research and education is of geopolitical and strategic importance for the EU. And at the same time, in our, the new higher education strategy of the European Union, uh, it's being acknowledged that higher education is pivotal to safeguarding our European way of life, um, driving Europe's global role and leadership forward. So what does this mean for higher education in emergencies? Can we coin this term and introduce it into our regular higher education cooperation framework, that this is a part of what we do, a part of our identity, that we provide this as international dimension to higher education collaboration with a clear European approach, which is currently lacking. But the fact that there's so many of you joining us online and here in this room makes me hopeful that this won't be the case for long. So, ladies and gentlemen, weapons won't make the world safer, but higher education and good quality higher education might or will. That's at least our strong belief. And while these weapons might be a necessary evil at the moment to safeguard what is dear and to protect um, a country or a region. Um, only the investment in brain power will keep us safe in the long run. So I would suggest let's get to work now in this seminar. Let's discuss and then hopefully act as soon as possible to make higher education in emergencies a reality. So. Thank you very much. That was my short words of introduction to the seminar. I set the scene, and I would like to now go to um, a very important group of stakeholders, um, namely the students, and to listen to their expectations. As you will notice, we will try to bridge um, the discussion from the current crisis in Ukraine to the uh, ongoing situation in Syria, and the expectations from students in the Ukraine might also be interesting for uh, that other discussion. But now I would like to ask Matteo, who is joining us from Italy, and I don't know whether Kirill Nomenko is also on the line, live from Kiev. Yes, Very happy to have you here this morning online. I'm grateful to our technology that we're able to connect you to us and um, that you are able to address this a uh, community here that is very engaged in providing higher education solutions for um, difficult situations. Matteo, please. Actually, uh, Kirill is going to start, but I can say very few words. Thank you very much for uh, um, for uh, for inviting us, both uh, uh, both me and Kirill. And uh, we think that uh, this uh, comes at, at the very right moment, where uh, uh, yet the latest uh, humanitarian and uh, geopolitical crisis uh, uh, hits uh, Euro hits Europe now more directly. But um, this need this means that we need to have a, a plan, a strategy, and uh, we think that uh, starting from uh, from Kiev's experience to Ukraine, we can also uh, actually understand what are the needs from this crisis and what should be the solution. So we'll give the floor first to Kiev, and then I will I will jump in. I have to beg everybody's pardon in advance uh, because this is a technical point that I have to raise every time uh, I go somewhere. There might be an air raid siren that might sound, so in case that happens, I will have to switch my camera and microphone off and relocate. Like, it's not going to take long, it's going to take like under a minute, but just so you are aware that might happen. Okay, uh, let's get to business. So, <coughs> uh, me and the Ukrainian Association of Students, we have done an extensive study of what the concerns in the Ukrainian uh, higher education system are. We have divided them into three parts, as requested. We have divided them into pre-war,
first stage of the war and currently. So which of these are uh, active and relevant now? So if we look at the pre-war slide, uh, the primary concerns here would be the digitalization of processes and information because most of the records are on paper, so they are physical copies. Uh, staff basic medical training, perfecting evaluation instructions. Uh, since the fall of uh, communism in uh, Europe, uh, the state demilitarized greatly, and unfortunately, that affected, um, in a, well, in a negative fashion, that affected the uh, medical training of non-military personnel, such as the staff in high education institutions. Cyber protection of online learning platforms, this uh, has been a concern in the COVID pandemic as well, which is still ongoing. I mean, uh, since the universities had to switch rapidly to uh, online education, there was there is still a concern that um, these platforms are not entirely secure and uh, that, you know, hacking and DDoS attacks might occur, which endangers the information, the private information of students. Maintenance of emergency shelters in institutions themselves and dormitories in particular. Uh, so again, a lot of institutions have uh, communist legacy laying around. So that includes fallout shelters, that includes bomb shelters, which do come in handy now, but pre-war, you know, we, we, we didn't really think that something like this was feasible, especially from Russia. So most of these shelters were pretty much neglected. Now, if we switch over to the next slide of the Russia-Ukrainian war and its first stage, we would be able to see that these concerns have multiplied. Uh, evacuation and relocation of students uh, and sometimes staff, that is, well, an obvious concern. Um, institutions, along with students, have relocated physically and um, in legal terms as well. So a lot of institutions have changed, or at least some that I know of have changed their legal addresses as well. Um, the way it's written, sometimes staff, that's because uh, staff are treated more or less as independent adults and they are basically tending to themselves and they have their own families to care for. So the university or the institution in general uh, mainly concerns itself with uh, students and relocating them rather than uh, relocating staff. <clears throat> Relocation of material and uh, institution infrastructure. So I made it in, into a separate point uh, because there's a lot of laboratories, there's a lot of archives, a lot of records. So all of that uh, falls under the material and infrastructure point. Relocating all of that, again, this ties into the digitization problem that we had pre-war uh, because this issue was not resolved quick enough. We had to face the concern, the problem of actually moving uh, the equipment with, without which the university or an institution uh, can't really function uh, outside of the of the hot zone, out of the uh, combat zones. Organization of study process, um, this is more or less kind of still active, but some institutions uh, have already taken a lot of steps to figure out how will they set up their processes. So in the first stage, um, this was really in the background because the primary concern was obviously the relocation of students and getting them to safety, but you still had to keep in mind uh, in terms of administrative staff, they still had to keep in mind that, you know, eventually they would have to restart the education process and get the students going. For example, I'm in the last year of my bachelor's studies and I have to have a diploma, I have to do my a bachelor's degree, I have to write it, I have to do my exams. So all of this they had to keep in the back of their head. Relocation of records, again, this is just for repetition's sake, because everything, well, pretty much everything was uh, and still is physical. So all the copies are physical and moving all of that, moving the archives is a major, major point in relocating an entire institution. Uh, readiness of institutions to accept students from other institutions. Um, so a lot of word institutions here. Uh, many universities, academies, institutions that are in the Western part of Ukraine, which are more or less unaffected uh, when it comes to physical damage, 
from the war uh, have accepted students from other facilities, other institutions across the country. But again, in the first stage of the war, this was, uh, you know, this was a bit of a shock. They, they weren't ready. They hadn't had the facilities to accommodate all of these students. They didn't have the resources to, to deal with them all because you have to house them, you have to feed them, you have to give them something to do, and they weren't ready for that. So that was a major concern. If we move over to the present day, now we have figured a lot of these concerns out. Okay, I'm still not seeing the, the next slide. There you go. So the Russia Ukrainian war present day, uh, we have figured a lot of things out. Uh, but now, as we move on with the education process itself, the next question comes up, which is the quality of education. Who will control the quality? How will the process be organized? Like in the details, how will it be organized? Um, what about the exams? What about the diplomas? So all of that is still in the works. This is an active and present issue that we are dealing with. I mean, our institutions are dealing with it and we as a students union are sort of overseeing the events that unfold. Support for higher education institutions, staff and students. Uh, this is an ongoing issue, but more of a positive issue rather than negative one. Um, education institutions are providing a tremendous aid to and are being of enormous help to both staff and students. Again, they have figured out their uh, housing problems for the most part, and they are able to accommodate, you know, all of the internally displaced students that perhaps wish to continue their studies in another institution, let's say in the west of the country. So institutions are dealing with that. They are figuring things on the go, but they are doing a good job. They're very organized and they are very motivated, obviously, to help their countrymen. Organizing the enrollment campaign. Now, this is um, a very touchy subject, a very touchy issue, since we don't know how long the war will last. I mean, regardless of the developments, right, we still can't predict what will happen. I mean, tomorrow, really. So it is a major concern uh, regarding the enrollment campaign because we have to get, we have to keep the institutions going. And for that to happen, we need to have students. Uh, so a major point is organizing an enrollment campaign. How will it be organized? Where will the students go? to submit their forms, right, to fill out forms, to submit their records, to submit their uh, secondary education grades uh, and be able to write entrance exams. These are all active issues that the ministry, along with individual institutions, are working on, uh, but it's still sort of in the works. We haven't figured it out yet. Uh, organizing a strategy of communication between the state and institutions Again, um, this is an unfortunate happening because the war was such a shock. Uh, communication breakdowns regrettably happened. So the ministry is kind of doing their own thing. They are more focused on the secondary and primary education, whereas the high education institutions are more or less on their own. Like, I, I don't really want to use that word, but that's kind of what it is. Frankly speaking, they have to figure out their own uh, ways of dealing with their own individual concerns because every institution has something unique to it. Their situation is more or less unique case by case. So they have to figure that out on their own. And uh, organizing a strategy of communication is an active concern and something that we, as a student union, uh, actively attempt to participate in. That if there is any way we can help bridge that gap. So, for example, communicate from the students to the relevant people in the ministry directly. We are trying to do that as well. We are providing polls. We are providing national polls so that the ministry is aware of what the students think, what is their opinion, uh, because, of, of course, this is vital in the student-centered learning. So these are the major points. There are uh, numerous smaller ones, but in terms of developing a strategy, which is what we are doing here, these are the major points of the Russia-Ukrainian war. 
as of pre-war, the first stage of the war and uh, present day. Thank you. And uh, we think that uh, um, if we go to the next slide, um, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the the Ukrainian war is not uh, the human the only crisis that has happened and that has touched Europe. Um, Lately, uh, we can quote, for instance, the, uh, the Belarusian crisis uh, and the Russian repression after the 2020 Belarusian elections and the uh, Taliban takeover of, of Afghanistan. Uh, in both cases, uh, there have been uh, the uh, creation of support structures uh, for, um, for, for students, for example. Um, in one case, the EU for Belarus SALT that uh, is uh, administered mainly by, by the engineer, um, and we have um, Mr. Fonseca from the Ginea here, uh, while for what regards Afghanistan, it was uh, mainly, let's say, outsourced to uh, an organization, to an institution called the Global Campus on Human Rights, to which uh, the Commission gave uh, gave funds. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's the problem of creating, of setting, setting up uh, ad hoc solution is that uh, the response is not prompt, and uh, there are of course these functions that uh, that uh, that happen due to that, uh, in terms of size of the uh, of the programs based. Uh, like related to the needs, compared to the needs, uh, the funding certainty, uh, for instance, for the Global Campus on Human Rights, initially it was uh, only for one year, and uh, we don't know whether it will continue, uh, and bureaucratic procedures that were, for instance, for what was the, uh, the Belarusian program that uh, led many students not to have these months. So if you go to the next slide, we can see that basically uh, there is a need to have a European coordination point for uh, higher education emergencies. Uh, we need a, a coordination framework where uh, the EU institution uh, have basically the, the general view and coordinate with national uh, authorities, but also NGOs like, uh, like ours, stakeholders, United Nations agencies. Uh, and this is needed because uh, um, differently for uh, uh, compulsory education, higher education is not compulsory. So you don't have a legal obligation, for instance, as it is for normal, uh, let's say, compulsory education. Uh, within three months that you arrive in a country, uh, you need uh, that pupil to be enrolled. So it, there's a, the, feed, the risk that it is that it uh, is overlooked, and at the same time we cannot reinvent the wheel uh, at each emergency um, because uh, otherwise we have the same uh, dysfunctionalities that we saw in the uh, important but still insufficient programs for, that were for Belarus and for Afghanistan. So we need uh, an organizational structure that, uh, uh, but at the same time it is difficult to have an organizational structure that. Uh, is in standby for for long periods and then uh, you know uh, it is activated uh, uh, out of nowhere. So we need uh, something more permanent. And this is where we go to the next slide and uh, we go to the um, proposals that um, have been uh, done uh, recently about an EU student at risk scheme um, that uh, several stakeholders include uh, included the day but also Na Nava H uh, um, HK Deer and. ASU, EUA, scholars at risk, etc., have uh, have proposed, and it is based on uh, some on, on some national example like the Norwegian Students at Risk Program, the German program, where uh, basically uh, students that are at risk of repression in uh, third countries can go study uh, in uh, Norway and Germany, and uh, the EU program uh, on our vision would be uh, basically a single entry point and coordination for uh, national schemes that would be co-funded by by the EU2 and we, we at least uh, um, extend it to the Erasmus plus countries if not uh, more uh, and where the nomination came from higher education institutions and also uh, student unions. We were also thinking of having two tracks which uh, so far don't exist so the student track which would be the normal let's say student at risk where basically uh, you take students at risk of repression but also uh, so-called refugee track where um, for people that have uh, students that have humanitarian uh, protection uh, that are asylum seekers or refugees could, uh, could apply and this is where we go to the next slide and to the proposal that we do uh, here today which is that we should combine the two proposals um, we should have uh, within we should establish this kind of uh, this kind of student centric scheme and uh, within the refugee track have a subunit uh, that uh, uh, would actually be um, that would actually be activated um, within for when we have emergencies. So this so this subunit would uh, uh, normally work on the refugee track, but would be ready to uh, to scale up uh, in case of humanitarian crisis, and would coordinate with a pre-established network of actors, which uh, would include uh, UNHCR, UNESCO, the member states, uh, NGOs, and stakeholders, as we were saying before. 
it should coordinate with the uh, EU Emergency Response Coordination Center, which is the civil protection mechanism. They have already many systems uh, in place and to which to coordinate, so it would be very useful. And also it should have a, um, a global Europe approach, meaning that in order to, uh, to be affected, we need also to, to be effective, we need also to have contacts on the ground and we need to be ready to be put in contact, uh, to have this coordination point to be put in contact with the organizations on the ground. And on that, uh, um, it's important to have uh, global actors as a contact point, uh, for, for example, the UN agencies, but uh, for what regards the stakeholders in perspective, for instance, the Global Student Forum, in order to be able to contact uh, the persons, uh, the, the organizations that are on the ground. And we would need also to promote something similar uh, at the national level. So a structure that uh, that uh, would be uh, would allow um, member states or countries participating to the program to actually uh, be able to uh, to step up and uh, to uh, and, and to welcome uh, people uh, fleeing from humanitarian crisis, so that also they don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel. So these are uh, the two proposals that the main main proposal that we have. Uh, and uh, in the next slide, we, uh, we have finished the presentation, but uh, you can also have your our contacts should you like to. to have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is on. Thank you very much, Matteo and Kirill, for um, highlighting and emphasizing also that. Um, Kirill, in, in your case, that also institutions within the Ukraine are facing similar challenges to higher education in emergencies as neighboring countries. So I think this is something we need to take into account when we discuss a European approach. And thank you to Matteo also for outlining the expectations the proposal on how to go forward at the European level. I think those are very valid points, and I'm sure that the other speakers will pick up your suggestions, your ideas. So while I leave you to um, listen to our conversation uh, further, I would like to um, see whether Fernando Fonseca has joined us uh, online. Fernando uh, works as a policy officer in DG NIR uh, and the support group for Ukraine um, at the European Commission. Welcome, Fernando. Good to have you here. Join us online. You're very welcome. And yeah, the floor is yours. I hope... Um, you found it as inspiring what the students had to contribute um, as I did and that we can continue the conversation now uh, with a focus on Ukraine um, and to see what can be done uh, ad hoc. Please, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this event and uh, good morning to all participants. Um, unfortunately, I joined a bit late because I had another uh, event before, so I may have missed uh, some interesting presentations from your side. Um, I would start by uh, telling something about Erasmus+, Plus, what we have been doing. So our first concern was, of course, the safety of uh, all participants um, in our programs. Uh, were staying in Ukraine uh, so that they could safely return uh, home if they so wished. Uh, then, of course, we, th we, we thought about the Ukrainian participants that are in our countries, uh, in our education institutions, and uh, we, we encouraged our um, higher education institutions to explore uh, all the possibilities to prolong uh, their stay in our countries. Um, of course, we are already reflecting, and DG uh, Education and Culture is already reflecting on uh, more actions and more funding for the 2023 uh, work program. So this is still a bit uh, far away. Uh, it will take some time, but we are also... Uh, looking at all the, possi uh, the possible flexibilities under the 2022 annual work program so that we can boost uh, support uh, to the higher education students and staff um, currently in a member state or in a country related to, to the program. So, for example, in the international credit mobility, 
uh, we know that we need to, to show maximum flexibility so that uh, this funding uh, possibility can be uh, I mean, used as possible. We know that there are difficulties. I can give one. For example, it will be, it will be very difficult for host institutions in Ukraine to sign a, le a learning agreement with uh, a student. So here we need to find uh, some flexibility to this and DG AAC is uh, looking into that. Uh, also our host institutions uh, in our countries or uh, in countries associated to the Erasmus Plus, um, they would need an interinstitutional inter agreement uh, with the sending institution in Ukraine. Uh, this may be uh, difficult to do. So also there we are looking into possibilities of flexi uh, flexibility. But we, we know that we need to do more. And uh, I would say that uh, the most important for me is the fact that we are uh, trying to open up the Erasmus Plus mobility scheme uh, which concerns intra-EU mobility, uh, exceptionally to incoming participants from Ukraine uh, in the fields of education and training. Uh, so higher education institutions that are currently, or that, that are have currently uh, available uh, funding, uh, to send their students and staff on a mobility period in Europe, we want to give them the possibility to use those funds not yet used to uh, accommodate students and staff uh, that would come from Ukraine uh, for a period of 12 months within their institution. So they, this, the, the, the students and the staff could stay 12, 12, 12 months. And then uh, comes the idea that we are also discussing in the engineer and in the support group for Ukraine, of course, in cooperation with DGAAC, of a scholarship scheme um, similar to what was done for Belarus and that you are uh, very well acquainted with. Uh, I'm afraid I cannot give you uh, today uh, a decision because there is no decision yet. We are exploring two possibilities. So either we will have a scholarship similar to, 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 to the Belarusian one, or DG EAC is also exploring the possibility to uh, go beyond the 12 months that I have just mentioned and to be able to prolong the stay of Ukrainian students in Europe in our countries. Uh, so it would be an extension, if you want, of the Erasmus Plus possibility. So either it will be done via a scholarship scheme with Dicinier money, or uh, if this is not uh, possible, and when I say if this is not possible, it's not because we don't see the, 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 the merit of it, it's because we may have some funding problems. You know, we have uh, quite an important funding for Ukraine for this year. Uh, we have an, uh, an amount of approximate 300 million euros. But as you can imagine, uh, there are many competing needs. The needs are huge in all different areas, from energy to housing, to security, to education, of course, uh, to health. I mean, to name just a few. So we really need to see how best we can use our funding. The scholarship, it's important. It's an important scheme. But if we cannot do it, as in the engineer, DG EAC is willing to step in and find a solution which would go beyond the 12 months that they are already willing to cover in under Erasmus+. Plus. So one way or the other, we will find a solution. Then in the engineer, we have also received, and in fact, it's, it's a proposal that was addressed to President von der Leyen herself to finance or to support an online Ukraine university. So the president received this proposal and asked us to assess 
whether we could support this. So we are also discussing uh, in the junior and in the support group for Ukraine whether we could support this with the package I have mentioned of 300 million euros. Um, I mentioned education is covered by this, uh, uh, this assistance package, but uh, what we are now planning is not linked to, to, to higher education. It may be interesting or uh, useful for you to know. It's on digital education and uh, it's uh, more to build on existing platforms uh, uh, that already exist to improve uh, online education, uh, not only in Ukraine, for, 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 uh, for Ukrainians in Ukraine, but also for Ukrainian pupils and students that have fled that have came out, uh, went out of the country and are now refugees in the EU member states. But this, of course, as I said, it's not concerning, uh, it does not concern higher education. And that's all I wanted to tell you today. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. I will try to reply as best as I can. I unfortunately cannot stay with you uh, beyond uh, uh, noon, uh, sorry, beyond 11, because I have another meeting at 11, but I will still have 14 minutes to, or 15 minutes to stay with you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Fernando. It was a pleasure having you here. I think it's very encouraging um, that there are certain scenarios um, being thought through, uh, thought of, um, I think flexibility is definitely a key word in terms of using existing programs to match the actual need, but probably also thinking with a slightly longer term perspective, because we don't know how long the situation in Ukraine will last. And the experience from previous uh, crisis, uh, for instance, Syria shows that we need a very long breath. And um, that's something that probably when designing uh, countermeasures or measures to support uh, higher education in emergencies. We need to have that long-term view. But thank you very much for outlining what ad hoc decisions and discussions are ongoing within DG NIR and also within the commission between the several um, DGs. It's uh, great to hear that. And I think it's also contributing to some of the aspects the students outlined before. Um, now, we will pick up some of these discussion topics in the panel discussion in a minute. Uh, but before we go to the panel discussion, we have a final round of input by my colleague Carsten Walbiner. He is the director of our HOPES Lebanon project. I said in the beginning we would uh, draw parallels and, and try to connect the current discussion on Ukraine with the um, yeah, discussions with the measures that we've seen in the Syrian crisis. And uh, therefore, I think it's very appropriate that we talk about also what has been achieved, what have been experiences um, in um, dealing with students from Syria, uh, catering for their needs within the region. So I'm happy to have you here on stage, Carsten. And I would suggest I leave the floor for a second to you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, um, colleagues and friends, uh, my short presentation goes back um, on an event we had um, last November, um, taking stock of what has been done, um, what has been supported by the Madad Fund um, in the sphere of higher education with, um, in the context of the Syria crisis. And no one could imagine when we, when we met in November um, what, what happened afterwards, so the Ukrainian crisis was, was not foreseeable. But on the other hand, I think what happens in the Ukraine um, is also providing our recommendations um, deeper and, and, and more important relevance. Um, but before um, presenting our key recommendations, let me remind you of, of what has been done. And, and by the way, all the implementing institutions, um, the German Jordanian University, SPARC, and the HOPES Consortium, consisting of um, the DAD, um, NUFIC, Campus France, and previously also British Council, are here today. So should any one of you have questions on our work, um, please reach out to us. 
do I have to start the presentation or by doing what? The Syrian crisis, which started in 2011, has been devastating to the Syrian population, as well as to neighboring countries. With millions turned into refugees, access to higher education became limited for young people, who were, and partly still are, at risk of becoming a lost generation. Strongly believing in investing in higher education as an asset for the future of individuals and societies as a whole, the European Union was among the first to respond and has donated thus far more than 94 million euro for higher education through the EU Trust Fund in response to the Syrian crisis established in 2014. To date, more than 7,300 young Syrians and disadvantaged youth from the host communities in Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, and Turkey, of whom 46% are women, have been benefiting from opportunities for higher and further education financed by the Medad Fund. These achievements have mainly been realized by three interventions, which started implementation in 2016. HOPES, a consortium of four European institutions in Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. EDU Syria, a consortium of Jordanian and European institutions led by the German Jordanian University in Jordan. And SPARK, a Dutch international NGO in Iraq, Lebanon, and Turkey. Although the approaches and partly also the focus of these interventions varied, they all served a common goal. Improve the students' prospects and opportunities, building up capacities, and strengthening the cooperation with local partners. As the crisis hadn't been solved, the Trust Fund decided in 2019 to continue its support for higher education by funding, although with a slightly more localized approach covering the whole educational pathway, a continuation of the previous interventions thus creating more sustainability and deeper impact. Hope's Lab in Lebanon, EDU Syria in Jordan, and Spark in Iraq. The support for alumni and scholarship holders continues on a regional level through the EU Regional Network of Alumni and Young Professionals established in 2021. By its belief in higher education as an important asset for stabilizing and rebuilding societies in emergency, the EU Trust Fund in response to the Syrian crisis has created opportunities and hope for many young people. It is now to be ensured that this commitment lasts and bears full fruit. Um, I think it's a solid basis of, of, of experiences we have collected, which allows us to draw a couple of... Um, of recommendations. If you look at them, you will not find them really surprising. I think that's something... Some of these points are even looking like being something absolutely logic in, 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 in working in project implementation. But let me make a few um, comments on the different points mentioned on the screen. Um, I mean, regarding um, conflicts and crisis, I think there are two undeniable observations. Um, on the one hand, the idea that political crisis would erupt and disappear like a natural disaster is not valid anymore. Um, we have to deal with what is called protected crisis. These challenges have become lasting issues, and the Syrian crisis is the best example for it. It's now in its 11th year, and there is no solution inside. Um, but there is another point. These crises are closely intertwined with already existing economic, political, social, environmental, educational, structural shortcomings in these countries. So they cannot be separated from the general situation prevailing partly since decades. Um, so what does it mean? We need a new definition of emergency. And such a new definition will inevitably lead to an adjusted approach. It has already been mentioned we, we should be prepared for conflicts. So we need an anticipatory or, or foresightful um, planning and acting. And this can only be the, the, the starting point for, for appropriate response mechanisms. And this is, as far as I can see so far, um, mainly missing. We still react on crisis situations as if they would come as a surprise, um, as if they would come upon us unexpectedly. Better coordination is something that goes normally without saying, but, but we have to think about it. There is still a lot to be done. And not only between stakeholders, partly also within institutions. And um, this has to start with the planning of interventions. It's often too late when 
there is the, 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 the effort to coordinate projects that have already been designed. It should be done before. Only by that we can really have the synergies we are looking for. And this requests a deep understanding of the conflicts based on robust data. Um, the point, localization and partnerships. I mean, it, it's obvious that local institutions know best what has to be done and also are often best prepared to implement projects. They enjoy a great acceptance in, in their societies and they possess, meanwhile, also excellently trained and experienced staff, not to speak of the much lower staff costs. But working with them also entails um, a couple of risks. They are often in a vulnerable situation towards the domestic political powers, or they are um, entangled with them. And we also observe um, that there are often deficits in their ability to provide the financial documentation and reporting, which is requested according to the Western standards. Um, a focus of international involvement should be definitely on the transfer of knowledge and expertise. There is, for example, an evident lack of study programs on crisis management in, in, management in many countries of the global south. Lately, there was a very telling article in University World News which reported on the shortage and low quality of humanitarian aid management programs in Africa. So that's something where, indeed, a closer cooperation um, on the international level is necessary. Um, adjusted and needs-based approach, also this is something which I think everyone would say, yes, that's what we are doing. Um, but still, very often what we are doing are ad hoc responses and um, based on weak evidence and therefore not fully fitting. Um, there is, by this approach of try and error, there is a lot of waste and, and, and also damage done. And so this definitely has to be fixed. And um, this evidence-based approach needs the collection of what I called before robust data. So there is a lack of really reliable and, and scientifically proven um, data. And here also um, an improvement has to be um, achieved. And one should not forget in that regard the importance of higher education in processes like the rebuilding or reconciliation in societies. This is often overlooked, but higher education institutions have to play and must play um, a decisive role in these processes. And um, very often we are focusing on support for individuals, and our aim is to help individuals to have a better future, but it's not only um, about helping the individual, we are trying or we should try to help societies, try, try to help societies to change and to reform. Um, finally, um, more sustainability. Um, if we return with what we have started with, the, the enormous um, achievements that have been able through the support of the, of the Madad Fund, um, it's clear that this support should be continued. This was also the message of the little video we have shown. Um, they should be continued also to avoid loss damages. Um, we still have to achieve a lot of things, so not all goals have been reached. But especially they should be continued not to let down people who need support and who have developed a very deep trust in you as a solid partner. Um, so. To do this, we do not only need a, a renewed design of pensions, but we should also reconsider the whole funding and support strategy, accepting that crisis and conflict situations are mostly the result of long-lasting structural problems, and um, deficits must be addressed, therefore, appropriately, and this will also give um, such interventions the badly needed sustainability. I mean, this was a tour de force, but we are ready to discuss these things. And I think also you have found the, the, the report of the event. I'm basing my, my, um, my presentation on, um, on the website. It was shared by the convener. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carsten. I think 
the three contributions were very insightful and provide a very solid foundation for the discussion we're about to have now in the panel discussion. I'm very honored that we are joined here today by Her Excellency Ambassador Sajjan Majali, uh, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Jordan to Belgium, the EU and NATO. Um, I'm also very happy to welcome uh, Manal Stulgaitis from um, UNHCR. I'm happy to see Michael Vorlander from the German Permanent Representation to the EU uh, here. And I'm also happy to have uh, Yannick Dupont from uh, Spark, the CEO of the NGO Spark that was mentioned before in the video. And I'm very pleased finally to hand over now uh, for a short while to my colleague Christian Hülshörster, who is the head of division for scholarship programs in the Global South at uh, the German Academic Exchange Service in Bonn. And I would suggest that all speakers uh, join us here now on stage. I hope you're all wired up uh, and ready to go. And then we'll have a good discussion. Christian, please. Versuchen wir mal die Gender, Mann, Frau, Mann, Frau. Wo kommt die Frau hin? Die Botschaft am Leben, Christian. Gehst du an da? Janik, Janik, kommst du? Ja. Und dann mit dem Besseren dafür unten Okay. Okay, once again, good morning also from my side. As you have heard, my name is Christian Hülzhorster. I'm from DAD headquarters, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator okay. today for this discussion. After all the insights we have already been given uh, by the first speakers, I think it's a wonderful opportunity now to have some real experts here on the matter sitting with me on the panel. They have been introduced to you already. And uh, I would like to start not really with a long introduction of each member of the panel, I guess, I will ask just to make them an opening statement. And I would like to focus uh, on a key question you have heard about before. Well, working on higher education in emergency, is it really something of a necessity or is it just a nice to have? And I would like to give each member on the panel here about two minutes for an opening statement, trying to focus on this question and of course tell us a little bit about their previous work. Madam Ambassador, if I can start with you perhaps. Well, Jordan, of course, is a country which had to do quite a lot with this issue, as we have heard before, not only from the European side, but also as a country who has received quite a high number of refugees in the past. So what is your opinion on this matter, please? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I would first like to start by thanking you for uh, uh, this uh, uh, invitation to speak on a very important uh, uh, topic, and uh, to say that, uh, and to thank all those who actually uh, made uh, projects and programs like uh, like this um, materialize. Mm. Uh, education uh, in Jordan is open to uh, Jordanians and non-Jordanians uh, um, without discrimination, uh, including Syrian refugees. And since the very beginning, um, from the beginning of the Syrian crisis, and we, we, we were talking here about the necessity to plan uh, um, as uh, the emergency uh, uh, start, starts, uh, um, the Ministry of uh, Higher Education had taken another, a number of uh, measures to facilitate uh, access of Syrian uh, refugee students to higher institutions um, of education in Jordan. Um, we've heard about documentation a moment ago, and these measures actually included uh, giving students extra time to provide required documents, uh, extending this time limit uh, for more than one semester, uh, and when needed even further than that, uh, to uh, provide these documents, uh, accepting personal information uh, that's um, contained in, ide in uh, identification security cards issued uh, by Jordanian Ministry of Interior rather than information in uh, passports and uh, other uh, uh, national uh, 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 documentation. 
and um, also considering a sufficient minimum documents required for equivalency of uh, certificates and contracting, um, and when uh, not possible, contacting concerned authorities to ensure the validity of uh, this documentation. Had uh, uh, higher education not, be import not been important, the ministry would not have uh, gone to all this effort to facilitate it in the first place, and uh, also would not have uh, um, provided the possibility to other local institutions, uh, including uh, universities and uh, um, higher uh, uh, education institutions, to uh, cater for this uh, very thing. And we have uh, successful, um, uh, uh, successful examples of, uh, of education of Syrians uh, at, at the higher level in, in Jordan. And uh, probably we will be listening uh, later uh, to, uh, to these uh, colleagues at a later stage. It's very important to uh, provide the possibility for uh, these young people um, to, to have uh, their dreams fulfilled uh, and uh, to invest in uh, their uh, education uh, because in investing in their education, we also invest in their future and in the future of their country. Definitely an education will assist them in, in finding a better uh, uh, means of uh, living uh, within the country uh, where they are staying, but more importantly, uh, once uh, the crisis is solved and uh, a political solution is found, these will be the people who would be uh, most probably opting to go back and build their country. And for this, uh, it is very important that we assist them in preparing themselves for this eventuality. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, my name Ambassador, for this opening statement. I would like to turn to Michael Vorländer, well, who is representing Germany here at the permanent representation to the EU. Um, Michael, I think the German government seems to understand that higher education plays a certain role in crisis. Um, well, we have been given some examples already of programs financed by the German government. What is your general opinion on the special added value of higher education in emergencies? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope my microphone works. And uh, first of all, I also would like to thank uh, the German Academic Exchange Service, the DAAD, for having organized today's event, uh, which comes indeed at the right time. I mean, we are all in the middle of uh, difficult uh, times. The situation is uh, really uh, serious for all of us. As our federal chancellor uh, put it, uh, we are confronted with a so-called Zeitenwende, a dramatic geopolitical a shift since 24th of February 2022, uh, when Russia actually um, attacked um, Ukraine. Um, we are also confronted with uh, huge numbers of, of refugees, not, all, not only from Ukraine, of course, but also in other regions um, of, of this world. As, as, regards, um, as regards the Ukraine, we now have four million refugees uh, and in addition to that, within Ukraine, we have uh, seven to eight million internally displaced uh, people, and the numbers, of course, are on constant, uh, on constant increase. Uh, Poland alone has received uh, more than 2.5 million refugees, and in Germany, we expect to um, have one million refugees from Ukraine. Among them, of course, um, uh, the majority of them uh, are women and, and, uh, and children. And um, I mean, what is also clear is that really for every beat of our hearts, another child has fled home in Ukraine. So this is really a, a serious uh, situation uh, that we are all confronted with. Of course, also many uh, students, um, I mean, so to say, um, are, are in danger, are at risk here in this context. So really a dramatic situation that we are confronted with, um, which requires, and this is the good message, um, I think we stand united. We are absolutely determined to uh, overcome this crisis, the European Union, but also, um, of course, um, the transatlantic uh, friendship and relationship is rock solid. 
uh, and uh, we are absolutely determined to address uh, these challenges. So, um, just briefly on Ukraine, if you allow me for a second, um, this uh, war of aggression against a sovereign democratic country that is part of Europe violates international law and is an attack on all of us. We must respond to it with firm resolve and Germany declares uh, its unreserved solidarity with the people of Ukraine uh, who have suffered untold hardship in the wake of the Russian invasion and we support every effort to end the war and violence and to re-establish the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. As you certainly know, or at least many of you know, uh, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany, in close coordination uh, with the Federal Foreign Office and the Federal Chancellery, has announced already on 25th of February, just a day after the attack, a sweeping change of policy also in its cooperation uh, in science, research and education. Our national and international efforts aim to isolate the Russian government to the greatest possible extent and all measures um, that are currently being implemented or have been planned by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany in cooperation with government agencies in Russia uh, will be frozen uh, or are subject to critical review and the same applies uh, to Belarus actually which is supporting uh, the Russian government. At the same time, I would like to stress that we will keep our doors open to researchers from Russia who face political persecution. Uh, we will stand by the people with whom we have cooperated for many years. Strengthening civil society is an order, it's the order of the day. And we want to continue the dialogue with civil society structures in academia and research in Russia to the extent uh, possible. And uh, let me also stress that we make a clear difference between uh, the Russian government uh, led by Putin and his um, and his uh, other his other accomplices, and uh, and we make a difference between the government and the people of Russia. So all our sections are not directed against the people of Russia. Uh, that's why we want to maintain, to the extent possible, uh, the dialogue uh, with um, uh, with civil society. Uh, we are also committed to ensuring that Russian and Bela Russian researchers and students working in Germany are not discriminated, stigmatized, and isolated. The freedom of science, teaching, and research are integral elements of independent democracies we cite by those who stand up for peace and these values, which are our European uh, values. Let me stress that. So this is the situation, a completely different picture. We live in a new world, if I may say so, Again, as our Chancellor stressed, it's a Zeitenwende, uh, a geopolitical shift uh, that, we, that we have to face now um, all together and which requires extraordinary measures. It is very painful actually to uh, restrict our scientific research and education cooperation as science diplomacy was always meant to, kept, to keep doors open, even in difficult times, also with countries uh, where relations um, are complicated. But this extraordinary situation, unfortunately, requires extraordinary uh, measures. So, um, getting to your question, um, you, you were asking in the beginning uh, whether providing support for higher education in emergencies is a necessity or nice to have. Uh, the answer, the obvious answer is, of course, it's, um, it's, it's a necessity. Solidarity is a key and uh, we need to stand together. We need to stand united. Uh, we have to provide uh, support both, both at national level, but also at EU level. Bold action is needed, uh, given this unprecedented situation that we are confronted with. We need to think big and not small. We need to team up efforts. We need to work together. We need to coordinate our efforts and our activities. Uh, that is the order of the day. And uh, why higher education? Um, as was said before by the ambassadors, and other uh, previous speakers, um, actually um, students and researchers are of fundamental importance uh, actually to rebuild a country and also of fundamental importance, it was uh, said um, by the colleague from, from Lebanon sitting here in front of me, is also so important for reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, so in Lebanon, this is a very good example. Actually on a more personal note, I was born in Beirut in Lebanon in the beginning of the 1970s when my parents uh, worked as professors at a, at a university 
And um, we had to leave um, the country end of the 70s. And this shows uh, it is complicated and it's so hard to reconcile the interests. So again, it's a necessity. We need the brain power, as was said by Michel Hörig in the beginning, the brain power will keep us safe in the long run. That's why we need to provide support uh, for students and researchers uh, in emergencies. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for this very clear statement and this clear commitment also. Let me go from the national level to the level of an international organization, the United Nations, of course. Manal, well, you are working as an education officer, or perhaps I can even say higher education officer for UNHCR. So I guess, well, you have a clear understanding that higher education seems to be quite an important part of all humanitarian activities. But what is your perspective and your experience here? How can you bring in higher education as a vital part? of all activities here in this field when a crisis is emerging? Mm. Um, it's a great question. And thanks again to the organizers for having this important event. Of course, it comes at a very inopportune time or opportune time. Um, but just to, to underscore, first, I just wanted to say thank you for the, the strong statement on Ukraine. Um, we're, of course, aware of the students that we support in and around Ukraine, who um, many of whom remain in harm's way. Um, and we are working with our country offices to respond to those who have um, fled and are now outside of the country. Turning, though, to the broader global scope, um, we have been delivering higher education scholarships with the support of the German Federal Foreign Office for 30 years in um, over 57 countries around the world currently. And they're all hot spots. They're all in countries where there are active um, movements, displaced populations, ongoing conflict, etc. So what, what I would start by saying is that there's no question to our minds, and more importantly, if I can speak for the students who've benefited from the UNHCR scholarship program, what they would say is that it's absolutely a must-have. Mm. There's no question about that. And I'll give you three reasons um, why we can line up the reasoning that results in a conclusion that, that you can't really refute. So the first is that over 86% of the persons of concern to UNHCR, well, to all of us really, are living in lower to middle income countries. So this is a huge burden and a huge responsibility on countries such as Jordan, such as Lebanon, and the many, many others that are responding on the front lines to the refugee crisis. Now, the second reason is that of the young people who cross borders with their families or alone, over 50% are children, and then between 20 to 25% of them are youth of college going age. So in that huge span of children and young people, as Karsten pointed out, what we know now over the past few decades is that the vast majority of them are in a protracted refugee situation, which means they will spend several of their academic cycles in a protracted situation. And so lots of times we talk about preparing young people to return home and become peace builders and leaders. And of course, that is the ultimate objective. But in reality, what's happening is that they are coming of age in the countries where they have been displaced. And if they do not have, if secondary education is the last stop for them, then that transition to self-reliance, to becoming net contributors to the countries where, that are hosting them, to building a future where they are comes to a screeching halt. Now, that doesn't mean that they need to have a four-year university degree or a master's or a PhD. There can be a whole different combination of post-secondary education um, that will allow them to assume um, and earn a qualification that allows them mostly to move from a precarious work situation with dodgy labor practices, et cetera, into something a bit more stable and a bit more sustainable. And, and what we also know from 30 years of running our scholarship program is that it leads to benefits not only for that student. Mm. That student is taking care of the family around them and most likely families who are in other countries as well. Um, so the third, the third point that I would raise then is that as an international community, we adopted the Global Compact on Refugees in 2018 and the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals that we're all familiar with. Now, in SDG 4, which speaks to quality, the right to quality education, there is specific reference to higher education. But more importantly, 
access to higher education plays into the achievement of so many of the other sustainable development goals. So when we're talking about green economy and, and green jobs, when we're talking about gender equity, when we're talking about um, decent work, all of these are as a result of, a lot of it is a result of having access to higher learning, the environment that's on campus, the openness, governance, democratization, et cetera. We all experience this, those of us who went, went to campus in person, I should say. Um, and so, I mean, the, te the, the premise of what I want to say is that, you know, of the 20.4 million refugees around the world, 25% of them are college-going age, and they absolutely need access to that advanced level of knowledge, qualification, skills, development, exposure, et cetera. And so, without question, it's a must-have. Well, one other clear statement. Thanks so much for the explanations. I think quite convincing, actually. Turning to you, Yannick. Well, Yannick, you have been working in the field for quite a long time already, I might say, as the founder and CEO of Spark. And I know Spark especially focusing also on the transition between higher education and the labor market later on. What is your perspective here on this issue? First of all, thank <coughs> you. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. First of all, thank you very much for this uh, Team Europe initiative from the AD. I think it's also very good to see that together we can accomplish more than alone, and I like this uh, framing in the Team Europe approach. Uh, first of all, it's also nice to see old friends back, of course, Karsten and uh, Michal Hörig from the Times of Bosnia. I think higher education in conflict in Bosnia and Kosovo, um, when we also work together. Um, now, first of all, I think to start with your question, yes, of course, it is important. Um, but I think in the day and age, when there is going to be tough decisions on priorities, I think it's going to be a lot about not if it is important, but how we're going to do this. Um, indeed, we've been working 28 years in conflict-affected states, uh, supporting youth to access the labor market and to get access to higher education. Um, what we have observed in that time is that every time you have a new crisis, and we've had a few now, we have since Syria, Afghanistan, we now have Ukraine, um, people even forgot about Yemen, uh, which is the worst humanitarian crisis still around. Um, political interest and funding goes to the latest crisis. So that means that also talking about the Middle East, you know, I think we will need to be realistic, uh, first of all. So what is going to be available? And that means we are going to have to make some very important decisions. Um, so I wanted to make three points. I think, one, we really need to make more serious headway in KPIs and in honest facing um, up to the issue of localization. So I remember when we started in 2015, there was a lot of discussion about the amazing capacity of regional actors. Um, but in reality, I think we haven't fully utilized it as a sector yet. And we have to be careful that localization does not become quick exit, exit when funding shifts and we all jump to the next crisis. So. Um, I think it's, very, it's really important when we think for next phases that we really focus on working with the institutions and put them in the driving seat. Um, and I'll say the reasons why. And I will not even start with finances. I'll actually start with um, relevance. So we have seen that if we really worked with local institutions, they were asking us, saying, wait a second, scholarships, but what do we need in five years from now? What is the labor market going to be in five years from now? What are the reconstruction needs of Syria five years from now? And then program scholarships towards that end. So scholarships as, as a means to an end, I think that was also your question, I think would be my first point under localization, to really make sure that you fit it in the local context and you include not just universities, but also the local, local business community in programming for this. Um, so that we are actually preparing these kids for a future after graduation. The second reason, and that is financial. I think by working with, for example, the universities in Kurdistan, but also in Turkey, on a partnership basis, we were able to enroll sometimes up to three to four times more kids in the same classroom, in the same program, as other programs. Because rectors started seeing it as a contribution to their effort, and not as an international intervention. Thereby really co-creating with them an intervention. And so I think that has also, with the shortage of funding, it's going to be even more important that we start moving into that direction even faster. Um, then, 
what also will be very important, I think, and, and, and it's maybe the wider perspective on localization, I think we need to have innovative regional funding mechanisms. So I think with EU Madad, soon we'll be placing 12,000 students, number 12,000 is coming up uh, on a university scholarship in the region. I think 40% were funded by EU Madad. The rest was funded by the Dutch ministry, but the big proportion by eight Gulf donors, Islamic Development Bank from the four JCC countries. And they have an interest as well in getting stability in their region. And they've been very important partners, not just financially, but again also as an Islamic Development Bank, talking to their member states like Jordan and talking about policy changes and how do we get these kids into work after they graduate? How do we make an enabling environment for these kids to study better? Um, yes, so two main points now covered. One, I think really going to localization. Second, really draw, drawing in other innovative um, uh, methods of funding because we're going to be short on it very soon. I would unfortunately predict uh, for the Middle East. Um, and third, I think we really need to start seeing also higher education as a means to an end, if we have lim limited means especially, and start from the perspective of the business sector, what will be the market, the public sector, what employment will be needed there, the reconstruction needs, and then pipeline our interventions towards that. Thank you so much. And since we are sitting here in Brussels and we have some colleagues from the European Commission here present with us today, just a follow-up question, um, Yannick. What are your expectations, really, at this point of time towards the European Commission? What is the role they can pay? Is it mainly we are looking for funding or is there anything else, really, we expect the EU to do? No, I think I'll start with the important policy things. You know? As a donor, you have a large, um, uh, a large um, voice in how we program as an international NGO. If you don't put any pressure on localization, it ain't gonna happen. Um, after 28 years, <laughs> I would pose such a statement. So I think, you know, really force, uh, force us, I mean, encourage us to really uh, work with local partnerships. Encourage consortia-led, like the German Jordanian University, by universities that are from the region, I think. So this is, I think, one. Second, enable these uh, innovative funding mechanisms. So at the moment, we are able to match every European euro twice or three times with, for example, the AGACC donors. But there is no mechanism, there, 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 there is no framework. So this is parallel funding and it's, it's going, but I think if we would structure this in line of the new Gulf EU policy that's being developed at the moment and make a framework for it, I think we could really boost that. I think we could really boost that if there is an enabling policy framework for that. Um, and thirdly, um, yeah, I mean, the EU has, has so much expertise and knowledge in different departments on the labor markets, doing labor markets uh, and jobs programming in the regions as well, uh, going to be available for the, I mean, is already planning early recovery work in Syria even. So thinking along in how to link the education work to the job work in terms of uh, jobs that will be later needed, reconstruction work later, later needed, I think is going to be a great value add. Michael Follen, there's the same question to you. Well, we've heard about the initiatives of the German government, also in coordination with UNHCR, like the DAFI program and several other initiatives. But what can the European Union bring in additionally? And I guess it's not only funding in the end. Yes. your mic, right? Okay. You give me a signal if the microphone works? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for the question, indeed. I mean, uh, again, there are already uh, multiple initiatives and programs and instruments um, at national level, and you mentioned some of them. I mean, the Hilde Domin program, a wonderful program run by the DAAD. We also have, for instance, um, uh, the Philip Schwartz Initiative, okay. which is run by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, aimed at uh, providing support mm -hmm. uh, to scholars um, at risk. So, and many other initiatives run by, by in Norway, for instance, in many, uh, many other countries that were mentioned by, by Michael Hörig in his uh, introductory uh, remarks, also in Poland, for instance. So um, there, there are multiple initiatives um, uh, already existing, and um, I believe that the added value for a really um, bringing together all these actors at the European level, establishing a holistic, uh, systematic uh, framework or mechanism for, for coordination <laughs> 
would really provide added value. Uh, I think, um, and that's why uh, the German government uh, welcomes, uh, expressly uh, welcomes the initiative um, by DAAD and uh, also by the Academic Corporation Association, the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education and Skills, the European University Association, uh, the Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange and ESU, uh, and I believe others will join. What I hear, Science Europe also wants to join forces here. Uh, we really welcome this initiative uh, to, uh, to call upon uh, the Commission uh, to establish a European expert group on students and researchers at risk in order to uh, achieve a, a systemic approach to address this. This is highly needed. Uh, we need um, this holistic systematic framework, not only focusing on one particular country. So um, as, as we have learned the hard way uh, in the recent weeks, we do not know how the future will look like and things can change so quickly. And we do not only have the Ukraine, we, we have the situation still in Syria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Afghanistan, many, many, many other places you mentioned, Yemen, uh, so again, um, it really needs a, a holistic view on, on all this uh, in order to coordinate um, uh, the activities and also to take, take stock of already existing initiatives because I think we do not have the full transparency what is already going on. So the, the added value of, of action here at EU level is uh, really coordination. It's about uh, complementarity. So what can we, what can we uh, do in addition to all these efforts undertaken at national level in order to, to have more impact? It's about scaling up. Again, I mentioned the numbers of refugees from Ukraine. This is unprecedented. Of course, we know that there are also many refugees still from Syria, for instance, in Jordan in particular, and in Turkey and other countries. But the numbers are so huge, the demand is so high that we need, again, that we need bold action we need to think big, not think small. So scaling up is something that the EU can provide uh, with the various programs that exist at, at a European level. Um, I mean, the, the, the foreign policy instruments, Erasmus+, Plus, Horizon Europe, and many more. I also believe that um, in such an expert group, in such, in such a mechanism, we could co-create and co-design possible uh, new measures that can, so to say, provide additional support uh, in comparison with uh, all these national activities and programs. I think also the EU uh, can provide topping up co-funding for already existing uh, instruments. I mean, we do not have to reinvent the wheel everywhere. Uh, I mean, let's build on what we already have. Let's build on the expertise um, of the involved organizations, like the DAAD, uh, like um, the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education and Skills, like many others. Uh, the Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange, and so on. And they have already instruments, and I believe that also topping up and, and uh, co-funding mechanisms uh, could, could also provide uh, uh, added value. Again, uh, the overall goal would be creating more impact, and, and I believe bringing together all the, all the actors, that means representatives from member states, but also associated countries, um, representatives from the involved agencies, but I believe also representatives from foundations. Um, I'm thinking here um, loud, possibly the Volkswagen Stiftung, the Volkswagen Foundation, and other foundations. I mean, they have a lot of financial power, and they have the flexibility also to bring to the table the financial resources, which we desperately need now for bold action, for bold uh, support uh, for students and uh, researchers uh, at risk. Uh, so therefore, I think there's a clear added value for engagement, for teaming up, for a true uh, Team uh, Europe approach uh, in order to uh, move things forward here and to achieve more. And again, I believe the European Union also uh, should really be a safe haven for international students and researchers that face the risk of persecution or that were forced to flee due to armed uh, conflict. So solidarity is an integral part, a core element of our shared values, of our European way of life. So I think this is really also an obligation uh, that we have, a political obligation, a moral obligation, uh, that, that, we, that, we, uh, that we show solidarity and that we, that we provide uh, support 
Uh, again, it's about defending our values, it's about defending our freedom, and we are one big family, I mean, going beyond the European Union, and that means we need to stick together, so um, a clear plea to work together and to team up. Well, thank you very much, but let me stay with the key challenge of coordination. I think everybody, more or less today, Carsten Wiener, everybody mentioned coordination is a key issue and challenge. But I'm ambassador, perhaps I can ask you, representing a country where lots of organizations, from the DAD to international organizations, to the European Union, showed up in 2015 trying to tackle this challenge of the Syrian refugees. How do you look at this challenge of coordination? What could we do better, really, in order to be prepared for the next crisis? Thank you very much for this uh, uh, question. And, uh, but before I go into uh, uh, answering it, I just want to, um, uh, of course, voice, uh, I wouldn't say alarm, but uh, uh, concern on, on, on what uh, uh, I uh, just heard with respect to potentially uh, having less funds for, for the Middle East. Uh, um, of course, we are all concerned with the plight of uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, leaving their country um, uh, and uh, and we hope they will be able to return soon and that uh, the um, conflict uh, um, uh, is ended and uh, there is de-escalation of uh, tensions but it is very important that uh, we do not jump from one uh, uh, refugee crisis to uh, the other. I think uh, Someone on uh, on this panel um, uh, said this, um, and uh, um, because by doing that we will be abandoning uh, uh, these uh, refugees uh, twice, and we would be jeopardizing uh, their lives, their hopes, also uh, twice. So it is very important that uh, when we um, uh, deal, uh, and it is uh, and it is imperative that uh, the international community responds to uh, uh, the uh, challenges of the um, U uh, refugees from Ukraine, but not to forget also the refugees uh, from Syria uh, and uh, the difficult challenges that um, other uh, refugees around the world are uh, are uh, facing. Um, in Jordan, you know, when uh, when it first started, we were receiving at one point like 5,000 uh, Syrians per day. And for a small country like mine, and just to give you an indication, we have around 1.3 uh, million uh, Syrian refugees, uh, around 667,000 have uh, registered with UNHCR. The majority have not. Uh, but we also have uh, refugees from 50, eight other countries, and uh, altogether uh, the refugee population is around uh, three million in Jordan. Uh, so um, it's really a very uh, big uh, um, challenge uh, for us to deal with uh, the issue day, uh, day by day. But uh, when, the, um, when the Syrian crisis first uh, um, er erupted and we started receiving uh, these uh, large numbers, uh, it was really chaotic because of the record, our plans uh, and our projections had not planned for so many numbers. I wouldn't even say the number uh, of how many we were expecting, uh, definitely not 5,000 per day. Uh, at one point, uh, things got out of hand and uh, the government, along with uh, stakeholders, came together and decided that the best way to proceed was uh, to work on coordination. And um, they were able to create um, a platform for uh, crisis response uh, for the Syrian uh, crisis, the Jordan response platform for the Syrian crisis. And it was under the lead of the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation, a mechanism for developing comprehensive refugee uh, resilience, strengthening and development um, in response to the impact of the crisis on Jordan. And uh, the stakeholders all came together, uh, NGOs, donors, uh, government institutions, uh, um, and uh, 
um, sat, discussed the issue, um, spoke about uh, what should be done um, uh, based on assessments of uh, what they saw as uh, needs and requirements um, uh, for uh, uh, refugees. And uh, it really facilitated uh, the whole um, uh, response uh, at, the, at, at the national uh, level. And it was also a um, um, tool to, to prepare uh, the response plans uh, over the years uh, in support uh, and for addressing the needs of uh, the Syrian uh, refugees. So that was a very um, useful uh, mechanism. And at the same time, if we are uh, looking at the different instruments that were there uh, to support uh, this crisis, of course, there was the Jordan response plan and there was also the Brussels uh, uh, conferences uh, that uh, had taken place uh, and numerous other uh, uh, initiatives and institutions, including the Madad uh, Fund that were able also to um, finance and fund very important uh, uh, programs and uh, projects that uh, um, uh, were very important for uh, the Syrian uh, uh, refugees as well as for the more vulnerable uh, local communities that uh, uh, were uh, receiving them. And uh, uh, with the coming uh, uh, to an end uh, with the Madad Fund, it is imperative we find uh, other sources to um, fund uh, successful programs. And when we talk about uh, uh, higher education, I, I believe we have in Jordan um, uh, a very successful uh, program for uh, 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 this very uh, issue. Um, I was uh, asking uh, how many students have uh, been able to graduate over the years um, with the university degrees and around probably over 1,400. And uh, there are others who are still uh, studying and that need to complete their studies uh, uh, and so, uh, so as to be able to uh, uh, move on in their lives and accomplish uh, uh, their, uh, their dreams. So um, also in devising any uh, packages, it is very important to also see what the needs of uh, the actual um, authorities are. Uh, for instance, um, and, and this, as, as much as assistance as we received in Jordan, uh, much of it had not really uh, always been focused towards the needs of these uh, uh, authorities and institutions. Uh, for example, when it comes to schools, uh, till this day, our, we have uh, 200 uh, schools plus uh, working double shift in Jordan. And, uh, and uh, when it comes also to, to uh, uh, even the facilities of uh, uh, certain schools as well as even higher institutions, a lot of them uh, need uh, uh, still maintenance. These are a few ideas, but just to say that it is very important from the very beginning to devise um, a system to coordinate uh, together and bring all the stakeholders together, also involve the refugees in the assessment of whatever is taking place and devise something um, uh, that, uh, that uh, could bring about uh, the, uh, all the um, good and all the uh, um, real services and real uh, um, uh, uh, value uh, for uh, these uh, refugee communities. Well, thank you so much. And uh, you have a quick intervention? Yes, with this one. I don't know, does it work? No, just this one. Okay, just many, many thanks. And um, Ambassador, I just uh, wanted to briefly react. I couldn't agree more with what you said also in the beginning that um, actually uh, we should and must not forget, I mean, all the other refugees 
uh, in other parts of the world. So, and let me also express um, our admiration for all the efforts uh, the Kingdom of Jordan is undertaking um, to, to deal with this situation. So this is really outstanding. And uh, so um, many, many thanks for, for all your efforts and for your activities. So, um, and just uh, another point that I wanted to add, which is, I think, also important, um, we, we get very positive signals also from the European Parliament, from several members of the, of the European Parliament, who are also very supportive um, of F actually establishing such a coordination uh, mechanism, expert group, however it, it is called at the end of the day. So uh, just to flag that, uh, that, um, that there is strong support also coming from the Parliament, which is also essential, and I think they also should play a role in such a mechanism. Uh, at the end of the day, they are providing the budget, uh, of course, together with the Council. But uh, So this is also a very important aspect uh, to be mentioned here. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, the issue of coordination and the coordination mechanism we are probably still lacking reminds me once again on uh, the topic uh, we are discussing here today. Well, the discussion is called, or the panel is called, Team Europe for Higher Education and Emergencies, putting the pieces together. And as you probably know, Team Europe is an approach coined in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, really, well, to raise visibility and, of course, to uh, have a better coordination mechanism between the European Commission, member states, and everybody involved, really. So let's see if the Team Europe approach can also help us for our topic here of higher education and emergencies today. And I would like to invite a colleague, well, we have been working with for some time already, Helena Barocco, who is uh, Secretary General of the Global Platform for Syrian Students. She's online from Barcelona, as far as I know or from, uh, is it Lissabon? I don't know. Well, Helena, welcome. And uh, we would like to listen, of course, uh, to your insight here, what you have to say. Do you believe that the Team Euro approach will bring an added value to the problem of coordination when it comes to higher education and emergencies? Helena? We can't hear you yet. can see you, but we can't hear you. Too bad. <laughs> okay, well, Probably we just postpone your statement for a short while and hope we can uh, manage a technical issue here. Well, going back to you, Manal, perhaps coordination, I think, is also one of the key issues uh, for your activities over the last few years. How do you look at this issue and how do you see the role of the European Union when it comes to coordinating different efforts from different levels? Thanks. Thanks for the question. And um, I imagine that Helena and I come in on fairly similar position on this. So Elena, I'll speak until you come on and then, and then you're, you're most welcome. So first on the question of coordination, um, in, the, uh, in the early days of the, the takeover of the Taliban, we convened a global coordination call of higher education stakeholders to understand what the response might be. Where the needs were is the first question, of course. Um, and a needs assessment in a quickly deteriorating situation is very, very difficult. So this, again, underscores the need to have a coordinate, coordination mechanism in place in advance and not be building it as the crisis unfolds. So I couldn't echo more what the other colleagues have said about the need for an established coordination mechanism that can then be put into motion um, before it is actually needed. Um, so in, in a similar vein with the respect to Ukraine, a couple of weeks ago we had another coordination call with some of the colleagues in this room and many, many others uh, across the globe. Um, and it should also be flagged that partners working in the higher education response space come in in very many different ways. We're talking about, um, you know, colleagues who are concerned with language transition, with bridging um, and, and skills acquisition courses to enable uh, young people to transition from one system to another. Credentials recognition is huge. How are students going to finance their studies if they've already paid tuition in one university and all of a sudden find themselves in a different country? Um, the list goes on and on. Um, so there's no question 
that we all agree that there needs to be an established coordination mechanism in place before the issues, um, the issues come into play. The second thing that I would say, though, with respect to Team Europe, is that from a UNHCR perspective, um, we ourselves have a standalone refugee scholarship program. There are many other of these standalone, specialized, very effective and efficient programs that, that exist around the world to serve refugee higher education needs. But it needs to be said that from the UNHCR perspective, our orientation and our commitment is to inclusion in national systems for refugees. So the idea that refugees will be given education, given refugee education, and then we'll finish that and go home is an idea of the past. And again, I mean, we can very easily point to Jordan where you see children integrating into local schools. Um, and this has been going on for many years already. And then you have variations around the world where there are refugee camps that are so remote that you indeed have schools constructed there where education is being provided by our partners. That said, our clear orientation is towards inclusion. And that's at all levels of education. That's in terms of access to health care, increase um, integration into the labor market, et cetera. And so to that extent, that's where I see the role of Team Europe and Team Europe initiatives at country level. Mm -hmm. And I think that it'll, it takes some convincing. We have some work to do. We have quite a lot of work to do to convince colleagues that refugee higher education, a degree of it can be included in just about every Team Europe initiative at country level. I mean, as I said before, whether you're talking about something that's related to democratization or green energy mm -hmm. or green jobs or, um, as I said, gender equity or TVET, if, if we can just keep in mind that refugees need to be included in all of those initiatives, then we take a giant leap forward in terms of supporting the host governments, the governments that are actually taking care of, of all these people who suddenly appear on their doorstep. And that doesn't mean, again, that, that we have to create special programs for refugees. And it doesn't mean that refugees will take away services from the national community. Mm -hmm. What it means is that when there's a large scale resource investment, all we have to do is insert, I shouldn't oversimplify, but what we have to do is always insert that refugees are also a part of this initiative. Because if we don't include the language, then they are excluded. The default mm -hmm. is that they mm -hmm. are excluded. Mm -hmm. Because we know that even when the, when the language exists, there's still a, a, a huge amount of work that has to be done to make it practically possible. So you can write the policy that said, Refugee children can have access to school. But then every single school administrator from the largest capital city down to the most local level institution mm. has to know that when a Syrian refugee, when a Syrian child shows up at school, they are allowed to register, regardless of what kind of documentation they have, et cetera. And that, you know, and we see some of the most challenging situations, for example, in Bangladesh, where it is not happening. The children are actively excluded from attending national schools. They are, they are attending informal um, community-led schools. They are not achieving credentials that will lead to even a primary or secondary qualification. So um, what I would say for Team Europe is that we are ready to work to continue to have these conversations so that Team Europe initiatives at, co pardon me, at country level can, can be written to be inclusive can be purposefully linked between the humanitarian response and the mm. development aims that they intend to be supporting and achieve, achieving in the long run. Well, thank you so much. And we try to go back to Helena. Helena, can you hear us? She can hear us, but we can't hear you. <laughs> try again, Helena. Oh, I'm so sorry, but it doesn't seem to work, unfortunately. Okay, we'll just have to continue, I guess. Um, Yannick, if I can go back to you. Hello. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, Yannick. <laughs> Helena, can you hear us? Oh, okay, because okay. I'm, I'm listening to you very well. Now it's your turn. Well. Yeah, now it's your turn. Please, go so, ahead. So, thank you so much for the invitation. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. It was a pleasure to follow the discussion at, until now. Um, and um, what I think is that uh, Team Europe has a huge uh, task uh, ahead. And um, it should lead to a reframing of the field of action 
uh, regarding uh, providing higher education in emergencies. So reframing the field is very important, not regarding a precise crisis that is unfolding, because unfortunately, uh, when it is the case, is uh, somehow late, but the point is to move from ad hoc measures, uh, specific initiatives such as, for instance, the MADAT Fund uh, some years ago and now, but really to make a step back and, and taking the driving seat uh, uh, to reframe um, the, this field of action. Um, Really, I think that uh, the European Union can play a very important uh, role to, uh, to produce a mindset change and, I would say, a paradigm shift. There are lots of uh, um, information and elements to do it. Uh, some have already been mentioned, linked to the SDGs, uh, uh, and in particular, I think, SDG 16, using the triple nexus, etc. Uh, this is number one, and I think it's really a structural, systemic, holistic work that has to be done. Secondly, I think that scaling up action, as some, uh, uh, some speakers have already mentioned, is essential. And for that, we also have some goals set already by uh, some international organizations, such as the 15 by 30 uh, set uh, by UNHCR, uh, but also at the level of the EU, uh, some additional uh, targets could be um, could be agreed. It. If you think that in 2018 there were 17 million uh, students uh, at tertiary level, maybe uh, uh, we can think of having them also part of the solution, contributing for a. A, a fund that can be created, but also when you think that there are 1 million point three international students, maybe the uh, European Union could decide to allocate 10% of this amount to uh, students uh, in emergency situations. These are just some examples. Uh, and of course, uh, I mentioned reframing. Uh, this field of action, scaling up uh, action, uh, and indeed we also need some innovative uh, funding schemes, as uh, uh, Yannick Dupont, uh, for instance, mentioned, because sustainability and lasting uh, funds are necessary, not only because there are emergencies, but also because there are protracted crises, and so there is the need for ensured lasting um, uh, action. Um, all in all, I think that uh, uh, this uh, Team Europe is really necessary, um, and its main role should be to advocate for a full EU strategy for higher education in emergencies. Just as a last point, uh, we in Portugal, uh, at our small scale, uh, as a small country, uh, we have been working uh, on this field. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, we have some modest, even, experience to, to, to share. And therefore, um, I must say that, uh, um, personally, I'm fully available to contribute to this, uh, uh, to this Team Europe. Uh, not uh, as uh, the Secretary General of the Global Platform for Higher Education in Emergencies, because I have resigned yesterday, and this is just a precision <laughs> regarding <laughs> my Sorry. introduction uh, uh, um, for the sake of uh, accuracy. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and uh, it's really a very uh, fruitful discussion. Well, thank you so much, Helena, for joining us here. Um, we are running out of time, but I've got one final question, and I would like to ask Yannick and Michael for a very quick answer. Well, what we have heard today is there's quite a long list of areas of conflict where students would be in need of support from the European Union in terms of higher education. How do we make a choice? 
Does it have to be our aim to help more or less everybody everywhere? Or let's say, is it also legitimate to make a choice based on the European Union's own geopolitical agenda? Um, we talked about Yemen, for example, mm. completely forgotten conflict. And of course, it seems to be quite far away from the European perspective. So how would you go about this issue, really? Mm. Yannick. Well, <laughs> I think, you know, to start as a realist, I think this is what is happening, right? So the mm. own strategic interest of the EU will drive their investment. Um, but I think as a sector, we need to push back on that a bit and mm. also explain that it is in our interest that these crises, even in Yemen, don't spin out of control and create further security problems also for the EU. Um, but I think so, I, so my answer is go global, um, but be focused because you cannot mm -hmm. do everything. Make sure mm -hmm. it's relevant to the future of mm -hmm. these kids mm -hmm. for their work. Look at innovative funding methods. Mm -hmm. One that wasn't mentioned so far is, for example, you can think about paying back schemes. If people get employment, that they pay back into a scheme. Um, and look far more, I would say, also at short cycle, private sector driven, non-university, but TVET courses that lead mm -hmm. to an immediate income. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we need to, in combination with localization, um, I think we can get far more cost effective mm. with the limited means we mm. have. Thank you. And well, the last word is to you. Thank you um, also for the, for, the, for the very relevant question, of course. Um, I mean, l let me uh, also stress that um, many thanks uh, for, for all the remarks, Manal, that you made on behalf of UNHCR, and I really believe we need to work very closely with UNHCR uh, for this uh, Team Europe approach. So um, this is, I think, a must. Regarding your question, um, of course, we need to be realistic. I mean, uh, financial resources are limited. And uh, certainly, um, there will be a, a focus now uh, on the Ukraine. Mm. But at the same time, I really deeply believe uh, that no one should be left behind. And we should and must not forget, I mean, refugees in other regions in, in, the, in the world. So, so therefore, I believe um, one way to tackle this is, as you said, we need to develop more innovative uh, schemes, programs. I mentioned earlier, I think it's really about mobilizing um, all available resources, also from the private sector, from foundations. They have a lot of financial power. They can chip in uh, their resources in a very flexible way. So um, I think if we, if we are really able to, to mobilize uh, all available uh, resources by all actors, then, then at least I, I would be hopeful um, that, we, that we can manage uh, everything at the same time, focusing now in, in Europe on, on Ukrainian refugees, but at the same time uh, keeping up uh, our full engagement for refugees in other parts of the world. So this would be my answer to this. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, just oh, yeah. That's okay, I'll use mine. Got 60 seconds. I'll use mine, that's oh, okay. okay. I just wanted to thank you for that, for sure. And I, and I just wanted to respond um, because DAD has so, I think, wisely um, and, and effectively co uh, convened this event. And Helena is here on screen. And I just wanted to recognize that DAD, while we're talking about Team Europe initiatives and, um, and the, the potential influence of the EU, um, the DAD has been a leader in what we call complementary education pathways for many years. And that's a, an avenue that allows um, young people in other countries to come to Germany to study um, at higher education. Uh, Helena's organization operates a similar type of what we call complementary pathway. And, and I just wanted to recognize that given that the, the mission of Team Europe is really about the promotion of European values and European culture and, and Europe in general, this is another way that, that the EU can simply through advocacy, through supporting the higher education institutions that want to do this kind of thing. It's not necessarily an investment of funding, it's, it's support, it's advocacy, it's policy change. And that's one more way that we can expand higher education for people who are at risk. Well, thank you so much, Manal, for this. Thank you so much for this intervention because it's perfect. I would like to draw your attention before we close um, to the manifesto uh, from the SHARE Network on expanding refugee tertiary education pathways in Europe. Um, it was developed at a conference in Bologna a couple of weeks ago. Some of you might have attended. I was there and it was a pleasure really to hear what our colleagues had to say on this issue. If you are interested, please do not forget to pick up copy. 
I think there are some hard, co uh, hard copies outside you can take. And of course, you can sign online if you're interested. Um, and I deeply recommend it. Well, thank you so much for this discussion. I think it's been most interesting. Michael, back to you. And uh, once again, thank you, Madam Ambassador, for joining thank us today. To all the panelists, to the moderator, we now go for a 15-minute break. We shifted the program slightly, so we reconvene at 12:15 uh, here, physically in the room, online. Um, and please do come back because we have some exciting case studies on how high education in emergencies works in practice. I'm really looking forward to the examples. We'll have another good hour of um, sharing experiences, uh, but please. Stretch your legs, get, a, get away from the screen for the moment, and come back in 15 minutes. Thank you very much.
Okay. We are a very disciplined audience. We're all getting used to this hybrid format. People on WebEx are probably not as patient as, as we are here. We're more flexible, but I think in the interest of time, we should continue. So if everyone could take their seats again and we can move to the case studies. Okay, I think we can do the countdown now. For the speakers, maybe before we go live, um, I will call. So, welcome back everyone. This is the second part of our seminar, Higher Education in Emergencies, Team Europe, question mark. Do we uh, get closer to Team Europe? We don't know yet. We heard so many good things in our panel discussion before the break. Um, so we can be confident that we are moving ahead on this topic, but um, we won't achieve it in one morning. What we can achieve, however, is to listen to some of the case studies that uh, we have assembled here for you today to illustrate why it's so important to work on higher education in emergencies. But before we do that, uh, we had one comment in the chat coming from the Ukraine, uh, from the Erasmus Bureau in the Ukraine, which we would like to read to you um, before we get into the debate and the discussions of the case study. So Anna, you have your, the comment ready, please. Is that on? Yes. 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 Uh, so the comment made by Svetlana Shitikova from uh, the Erasmus office in Ukraine is, I think, um, yeah, not just addressed to the online audience, but also to you. So we want to make sure that it's uh, shared here. Um, and also looking at the case studies uh, for a purpose, uh, there is no example from an Erasmus action there, but uh, it's a nice uh, comment also emphasizing uh, the really the strength of the Erasmus Plus community. Um, so she said, uh, we would like to thank you for your care, solidarity and support Ukraine. It makes us stronger. International Erasmus Plus, Erasmus Mundus partners have been providing the helping hand to their Ukrainian partners from the very first day of the war in different directions based on the people-to-people -people contacts and strong partnerships established. In addition, Erasmus Plus flexibility gives more opportunities for those from most unsafe places and for the temporary relocated students to study and traineeship for Ukraine and for staff to experience teaching. So this is, yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Svetlana. Thank you, and um, thank you very much to the colleagues in Kiev for sharing this with us. It would have been nice to, to have you here in different circumstances, but um, it's good that we are digitally connected. Now, who we do have here live and present is the president of the German Jordanian University, Professor Ala Aldin Al Halhuli. Uh, he is joined here with a student, uh, Zena Al Masri, of the uh, Edu Syria graduate. Edu Syria was briefly explained um, in the video we showed this morning. But I'm sure if you could join me here on stage. Um, and to listen to your case study on local, the importance of local ownership and the experience from the perspective of a student. Please join me here. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I am Ala Din Halhouli, the president of the German Jordanian University and Adi Adi alumni. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to hear. Yes. So uh, first, maybe I can uh, start with introducing the German Jordanian University as uh, a German Jordanian model of applied uh, education. So mainly we focus uh, on applied education, on uh, research, innovation, and entrepreneurship, on multicultural, multilingual uh, education. So in our campus, you can see people, uh, students, uh, staff who can uh, talk in Arabic, in English, and in German. Uh, 
uh, we, we are uh, so happy uh, for uh, inviting us to the, just to introduce the Idiosyria concept, uh, which is one of the uh, most successful programs uh, managed by the German Jordanian University. Uh, uh, and uh, it is the only project, uh, uh, local project, that is managed from a local uh, partner. So most of the projects, as said by Spark and uh, representative CEO and others, uh, are administered by uh, international or uh, European uh, Commission uh, uh, partners. But this is the only project with a huge amount of fund, uh, 32.6 million euros that is administered by the uh, German Jordanian University. Uh, as you can see, I will go just through the introduction of the, uh, the project, uh, and I will uh, give a few numbers about the achievements, about the uh, future plans of this uh, uh, project. This is a humanitarian project. In JGU, we have, for, for example, a School of Applied Humanities uh, and Language, School of Basic Sciences and Humanities. We have a dedicated program on social work for migrants and refugees. So, and we have the EDU Syria program. We are aware of the importance of being part as academic institution of the uh, support to uh, the uh, emergencies and crisis. And uh, uh, this, as I said, uh, supported by the EU uh, with 32.6 uh, th million in uh, different stages since 2016. Uh, and its main uh, idea first start to support uh, Syrians to uh, get education uh, in Jordan. Actually, uh, as Her Excellency said, uh, our schools are open for all universities also, but uh, the cost of uh, study at the university is also uh, high. So uh, the, the, this support enabled many of the refugees to have the opportunity uh, uh, to continue uh, the study, and Zena is one of them. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So uh, the program is also in different levels. It's a, uh, it can be uh, vocational training, uh, higher education, uh, uh, talking about bachelor and master programs, in addition also to some uh, upscaling of skills and uh, uh, programs. So, uh, as I said also, there are several versions, the Edusiria 1, the Edusiria 2, and the Edusiria 2 uh, additional, and we are now in the Edusiria 3, and hopefully we can have a sustainable uh, Edusiria program without 1, 2, and 3. Uh, in addition, this program serves not only uh, the uh, Syrian refugees, but also the underprivileged Jordanians uh, who are uh, also uh, recognized by the Jordanian government as underprivileged through, through uh, aid organizations in Jordan. It started in 2015, uh, and it will uh, last till the, uh, December uh, next year. Uh, it provided till today uh, more than 3,000 scholarships, uh, and we have already 1,444 graduates. Uh, in the EDU Syria 3, uh, uh, due to the, uh, let's say, the accumulative experience uh, and knowledge uh, built within the previous programs, uh, we uh, were able also uh, to start thinking about uh, integrating, actually, the, the refugees into the communities through having this mixture of uh, students uh, refugees and uh, uh, underprivileged Jordanians, having new programs, as you can see here in the list, uh, the uh, vocational training program, the bachelor program, graduate, uh, uh, graduate program, in addition to non-educational uh, programs. The non-educational programs uh, are designed uh, actually according to the market needs, in addition to the possibility of creating entrepreneurship uh, initiatives, uh, startup ideas uh, through uh, different uh, stakeholders in Jordan, NGOs uh, uh, and others. And uh, what's nice for the jo German Jordanian University that we learned a lot with this, uh, with this uh, scheme 
uh, of managing such a huge uh, projects. We counted on our local partners. We uh, have now uh, also international partners. The idea is one of them. Uh, and we are proud that we uh, were successfully managing that, having impact on the society, and raising the awareness about the, the, the humanitarian activities in, uh, uh, in Jordan and in the region. Uh, in addition, that we uh, started giving uh, not only hope for uh, the youngs, but also opportunities for uh, f uh, further uh, generation, uh, further generating uh, startup ideas or uh, connections to others. You all know maybe that Jordan is as, as a small country compared to others, but since the establishment of Jordan, the, uh, we are offering a quality of education and focus on the quality of education about the intellectual of our humans. So the Jordanians are considered, uh, uh, let's say, uh, highly qualified. And we are hub of uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, intellectuals and brains. Uh, in, the, in the university also, we, we believe on the concept of uh, let's say brain circulation, not brain drain. So we are trying now, okay, to qualify uh, people, educate them, uh, have uh, giving them the opportunity to find jobs in uh, in Jordan, in the in the uh, Gulf countries, but also in Europe. And we have a very uh, uh, important connections to Germany as a German Jordanian concept, and we are working also with. Uh, the Bundesagentur and with the employment agency in, in uh, Germany and others here in Europe. And uh, hopefully, we uh, will also meet the needs of the uh, European uh, uh, Commission. We also believe that after the, uh, uh, the crisis, the COVID-19 we faced a few years ago now, the Ukrainian, that the, 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 uh, the world is small. And we believe this is, we are a one world, not different worlds. We are one world. Uh, as you can see recently, we have an impact on Ukrainian. Uh, the, the impact of the Ukrainian crisis is everywhere. The impact of COVID is everywhere. There is a raise in the, in the cost and everything. And we are all together now to, to coordinate and find ways of coordination uh, to uh, help uh, people working together uh, and now I can say without visas, we are working now online, yeah? Without borders, without visas, without needs. Uh, we can uh, even uh, have a message from everywhere on WhatsApp, on, uh, uh, on Zoom, on um, MS Teams. So it, it's much easier than before to work as a one team uh, together. Uh, we recently actually also conducted a labor market uh, oriented uh, study to, to also direct our programs to the needs of the market. And as I said, it can be local needs, it can be also regional uh, needs. And we supported different programs uh, to alleviate, for example, the skills, to, to uh, improve the possibility of having uh, uh, startups. And this is a, a very nice example. Uh, we are collaborating with Shamal Start, this is in Erbid, uh, to support uh, ideas small ideas uh, for startups uh, with training and even a seed fund. Uh, and we have now uh, already four of these uh, initiatives uh, are hosted, actually, uh, if you can see here, uh, in the uh, Shamal Stars Incubator. Uh, it's the Wood uh, Shakers, Dion, uh, Fayha uh, Arts, and uh, Retail Perfumes. So th the project will fund 40 initiatives uh, 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 startup initiatives, hopefully to contribute also to create more jobs for the community. Uh, we as Jordanians, as well as Syrians, face the same problem. Le yani minimum number of, uh, of jobs uh, in Jordan, but hopefully with this entrepreneurship and innovation concept, we can create even and host uh, uh, programs uh, in, uh, in, in Jordan. Uh, we, we consider now uh, in our strategic plan at JGU for the next four years, uh, the innovation and entrepreneurship as a pillar. And we started even, uh, 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 let's say, promote JGU as a hub 
of innovation and to attract companies inside the universities uh, to start their uh, uh, job from the, the, the campus itself. Uh, so now uh, we have four uh, incubated, five uh, got uh, also the acceptance for funding and we'll continue doing that uh, during the uh, next time. Time is a bit limited in, in this I session. have one. <laughs> one more slide and then we move to your student. Okay. That would be great. Then, then, then uh, the tracer study, uh, this is a very important thing that we are tr trying to also to trace the graduates of this program and see uh, if they find jobs, how we can uh, support them. Now, Zena can uh, then uh, talk about, as one of the graduates, about her experience. She is now in France uh, learning uh, a French hope to continue her also master degree here. So, yeah. Zena, please go Good ahead. Good morning. My name is Zena Mosri. I am an uh, EU Syria graduate. Uh, my English language is not very good, but I will try to explain. I try my best to explain my experience. Uh, I will uh, talk briefly uh, about my experience uh, when I was uh, in Syria until my presence in uh, Europe. Uh, at first, I was in Syria. I completed uh, a higher school, high school in 2012. Uh, then uh, I moved to Jordan because the war uh, started uh, and the situation was not safe. Uh, <clears throat> when I arrived to Jordan, uh, when I arrived to Jordan, I, uh, I was not able to register at any university because my financial uh, situation is, uh, was bad, uh, like uh, all, uh, all most of uh, Syrians uh, refugees in refugee. Uh, then uh, for two years. After the two years, I... Uh, I able to uh, to register an intermediate uh, program, intermediate educational program. Uh, but uh, the certificate is not uh, enough. Uh, what I aspired uh, for my academic life. Uh, then uh, after that, I feel uh, upset <laughs> and uh, disappointed. Uh, and uh, I feel all the door uh, closed. Uh, I heard about uh, EDU Syria scholarship. I applied for it. I was accepted at uh, accepted to study a scholarship degree uh, business administration at the Zar uh, at Zarqa University. Uh, it gave me power uh, to continue my education high. Uh, uh, I was the uh, first in my measure. Uh, I graduate in uh, 2019. Currently, I uh, I am uh, I live in France in France with my husband. Uh, I learn French uh, with my bachelor degree and a new language. I uh, I would like uh, I hope uh, I hope uh, to. Uh, to get to well get uh, a good job uh, uh, opportunity, um, and I would like to thank uh, Edu Syria uh, for uh, the opportunity he uh, they they uh, give me, uh, and I would I hopeful to continue uh, their uh, their great work uh, to providing scholarship uh, ships for. Uh, Syrians uh, students because uh, there are a huge number uh, a huge number of uh, Syrian students uh, 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 don't sorry have not completed uh, uh, their uh, university degree uh, because uh, the financial uh, because uh, because uh, they suffer uh, uh, immense uh, poor financial uh, conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we ought to thank you that you uh, joined us here today, joined us here on stage. I think that was really 
a big added value to our conference, to our seminar, to really have a first-hand experience, mm -hmm. someone who's embarked on this difficult journey um, and is still yeah, in the middle of it, basically, in, in, in mm -hmm. France, adapting to new environments, adapting to the situation uh, as it is. And thank you for thank being you. with you. Thank you to the German Jordanian University as well for presenting so. their activities and for managing such an important project as EduSyria is. And I wish you all the best of luck with, uh, with the further implementation. And I would now suggest that we move to Thank you the next much. case study. <laughs> sure. If there are uh, questions, we hopefully, if we stick to our time schedule to some extent, um, we'll have some time for Q&A. And otherwise, for those of you here in the room, we can have our conversation yes, over sure. lunch. Sure. Sure. OK. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So next, I would like to call Yannick on stage. Um, you know him already from the previous session. Um, Yannick is joined also by an alumni, um, but in this case, not present in the room, but uh, through virtual connectivity here. Anwar Katan um, is joining us, hopefully, through WebEx. But uh, Yannick, I would like to uh, give you the floor you to yeah, introduce the Spark case study on employability. Here's Anwar. Hello, Anwar. Okay, Yannick, please. Hi, good Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if the presentation, I have to, I don't hear myself, I guess. Let's see if that works. Nope. Nope. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. I'm sure the presentation will come. Okay. Yeah, so let me then start by giving a bit of background. So. Um, we took one case study from Iraq. Uh, it's uh, one of the latest programs that we have been um, uh, doing with EU Madad. And why we took this particular um, case study... Um, ah, that's Anwar. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the other one. Uh, so why we took this particular one is because it, I think it tries to illustrate the power of working with local universities. And, and, and I think the prior study was even stronger in this regard because I know that the German Jordanian University from the very beginning of Madad was leading its programs. And I really applaud them for their results. And I think that this is important beyond just the mere scholarships you've provided, but also to demonstrate that you can build a very strong, good local program with very high quality uh, and large numbers of, uh, of graduates so far. So I followed uh, the work of German Jordanian University and I very much uh, applaud them. Um, yeah, so then to this one, ah, there we go. Yeah, so first of all, what we covered it already earlier, um, I think the Team Europe approach will be very interesting. We followed the, the Team Europe developments here in Brussels and tried to unite different European countries with different values add. Um, for example, you know, if I look at the strength of Germany um, in terms of quality education, master programs, the unique experience in, I think it's, I don't know, you can probably say for yourself, but I think it's over 75 years of experience in international exchanges to Germany and building very robust, strong programs, uh, combined with a German Jordanian university, which is a local initiative. Then with Spark, where we focus a lot on localization, on uh, partnering with innovative methods and the journey to work. I think the strength is not in the individual cases, but the strength is actually if we bring it together and link in pipelines our approaches. Um, so that, that's, that's one. Um, in um, Iraq uh, uh, is only one country. Uh, just maybe a very quick uh, s snapshot. I think I mentioned it uh, on the panel as well is that we've been working with 25 uh, university partners across all the neighboring countries of, uh, of Syria. Um, this number is now wrong, 10,000. I was just corrected actually before the panel. Uh, that is now 12,000, uh, mostly because of the innovative new uh, uh, partners that joined. Uh, actually also private sector, google.org is the recent uh, uh, group that joined us um, in providing these, these, uh, these uh, scholarships. Um, but what we did actually there 
um, is that we started in 2014, before we launched the scholarships programs, we started talking to the private sector and to the public sector um, and to the UN uh, and to GIZs, actually, who did amazing studies of the labor market five or ten years from now. They did scenario planning. Where will be the needs? Where will be the gaps? And then we decided that we will be offering scholarships in particularly the five top areas that would be important for the local market, but also for the reconstruction of Syria. Because at that time, we all hoped that there would be a quick resolution and that we would be building a whole workforce to go back. Um, and then 80, 90 percent of scholarships were targeted on that area. And it also influenced the decision of which partners to work with. So the, the, in Jordan, it was the Chamber of Commerce in Iraq as well. Uh, and the universities that were offering, for example, these engineering courses that were going to be high in demand. Um, then also we included from the outset work with the private sector on providing internships uh, and job placements. So we went beyond. So we said, okay, fine, you now explained where the need on the labor market will be. Um, and then we started working with, for example, um, the, um, an institute that's dealing with oil and gas in, in Iraq and saying, okay, could you introduce your partners that you're placing your graduates with? Can you make that available to the students that will be graduating from this university and organize career days uh, with them? Um, and secondly, also working with the private sector do, as was also explained in the previous uh, presentation, really work on supporting uh, students during their studies to think about do you want to be an employee or do you want to start an own company or a small startup? So there was a lot of startups, I think uh, 50 led businesses uh, so far, but now rapidly growing because the, no, uh, the amount of graduates is now coming out at a very high, high pace. Um, so in Iraq and in, um, in the Kurdish region in particular, um, with, the, um, uh, with the recent iteration, so this was built on a first initial program with the UMADAD, we reconceptualized it. So the first thing we did is we said we're going to do a consortium with local universities. This is not going to be a Spark application. And we had a bit of back and forth, I remember, with the EU saying, wow, can you make sure that everyone passes the Pader system and have all their files uploaded? And yes, that was a bit of a, of a complication. It was a bit of extra work to make sure that you fully qualify. But it succeeded. And I think what is very important is that what you then saw is a massive I think add, um, uh, add value in terms of that we could really build on the local career centers of the universities. Uh, in this case, the North Technical University in Mosul, Mosul University, Polytechnic in Erbil, Saladin. They all had already nascent career centers. They had already initiatives in career guidance, in some support to their students to make the transition from education to work. So instead of conceptualizing something new, they were basically in the governance of the project, they're in the governance of the projects, they are the first ones to suggest what they need, and they designed, they co-created the application. And, and I think that, that, that you know, the value of that cannot be underestimated, um, because it really became more relevant, it really became more, uh, I would say, embedded, and it's a much, much more nicer way to, to work together. So there, um, the initiatives that they are undertaking is uh, there is an innovation hub within the career centers that are creating uh, space um, for um, students to innovate their business ideas, also to think about where they want to find a job in the future and career guidance. Then one thing that really boosted during COVID, um, it started with regular internships and then suddenly COVID of course was hitting. So now a lot of these internships are also digital. So a lot of companies have been taking on digital interns. And that opens a whole new field that I want to put a big flag on because I think this is going to be trending, uh, online work and distant work. So we then found out that there is actually, also through our partnership with Google, that there's a lot of companies that would be interested to hire over internet, basically, or to have folks be educated in coding, in digital skills, and not necessarily have to enter a physical office all the time, or maybe not even, if they can work online. And we see this as a trend. We see many operators in the region now picking up on this. Um, and it's definitely something that this program will really uh, invest in um, with the EU, but also with now these new partners like Google coming on board, um, and possibly others from the region soon. Um, then the final track that I want to put an, uh, an emphasis on beyond the uh, immediate scholarships was curriculum improvement for the TVET short courses. 
So we also found in the first iteration of the scholarship program that actually it was sometimes more easy for students to find employment if they've done a higher vocational degree or something very tailored to the needs of the labor market. Um, and so we've been investing a lot in curriculum development with the universities and the industry, so starting with the industry, in do new um, needs assessments, what will students need to learn in terms of learning outcomes, and then work it back into the curriculum. So start with your products at the end, what will be the job needed, and then work it back into the curriculum. Um, so that, that's another innovation in the program that is taking off quite, uh, quite nicely. Um, yeah, so what were the lessons learned? I think I've already mentioned a couple, uh, and with a view on time, I'll try to be very brief here. I think really this driven by local partners, I keep emphasizing it, um, uh, really important, um, and aligning it with the economic priorities of that region. You know, If you make it a partnership, and if you make it a partnership with the corporates in that region, um, you will make sure that also we don't raise false hope of students that they graduate with something that is not very relevant. I think we need to also protect these kids and guide them a bit to where we think there would be employment in the future. Now, that means also from the beginning, really start with designing. So don't design a program and then onboard partners, no. Actually, in the latest um, uh, uh, programs, one actually is an EU innovation SME program that we are now launching in the region that we won. It was really co-created with three strong flagship organizations from three MENA countries. And they wrote the first version. They wrote the first version of their plan for their country. We helped to broker to bring it together. And now it's a very strong regional uh, program. Mm -hmm. My time is up. So um, again, to round up, um, also just make sure that you really foc focus on the end result. What are the gaps in employment? Where are you educating for? Um, and create these links between the private sector and the universities to make that gap uh, uh, smaller. Uh, start with internships and job placements during the university time. Also with helping students to do their startups during their education time because then they have the space to uh, to, for trial and error and to, uh, and to see what they, uh, what they do. And make sure that you really make it a student journey, that you look at your client. I know in higher education it's a bit of a difficult word to use, but see the student as your client that needs to get a job and then try to see what steps they need to take from the beginning to the end of their employment with the industry. Um, I had some other companies, but I think it's nicer to listen to Anwar exactly. uh, about his company and what he's been doing to set up his own, uh, his own enterprise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yannick. Uh, Anwar, it, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have the presentation? Where are you joining us from, Anwar? Yeah, I'm joining uh, you from Turkey, Gaziantep, South East Turkey, near to the Syrian border, actually. Uh, today, I am happy to be with you and share my experience uh, and my 10 years of uh, refugee here uh, in Turkey. Uh, I will start uh, about myself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I will start uh, speaking about myself quickly and what based in Turkey. Uh, my study background is architecture. Uh, and now um, I have a company called Afka Design which we are working uh, on product design and development in different sectors, uh, starting from gifts, uh, packaging, and uh, decoration, and including also uh, children toys and other uh, daily uh, used materials and tools. So we have the process of uh, design, uh, prototyping, and testing the product then uh, producing. I have more than five years of experience in this field. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, what I uh, uh, no the one before. Uh, what I will start about Spark first. I would like to uh, thank Spark for their uh, support, not uh, only the education support or the scholarship. Uh, they just started with us uh, building our capacity uh, regarding our skills, uh, finding the career path, and after that, if we would like just to go for finding a job opportunity as employment. In, in, in employment market, or we would like just to open our uh, own, own companies and start our own projects. Uh, after that, uh, the uh, continuous uh, support uh, during pandemic, during COVID-19, 
and uh, after that uh, the all uh, all process uh, uh, including uh, including some mentoring program including training and other support next slide please uh, what uh, what uh, the scholarship? What I'm now understand is not just about to be in refugee community uh, or in the new community. It's not just about learning or getting a certificate. It's about finding new new friends, networking with the local market, entering the ecosystem, attending some conference, uh, other training sessions. So you will understand more the local community and understand the the ecosystem, and you can. Uh, act according to to uh, to what you learn and what you get from uh, from the new environment, and after that, uh, uh, receiving some grants or receiving some uh, uh, programs, uh, attending some programs, so will support you just to uh, have a new a new career or a new company uh, and start your uh, your new life. Next slide. Uh, actually, Spark opens the window for for many refugees here in uh, in Turkey, especially what I know about. Uh, and this is uh, included, as I told you, uh, submission projects, finding employment uh, chance uh, to enter the the local market and to make income in the end of uh, of the uh, scholarship, not just to have certificate and uh, sit in the at home after the end of the university. Uh, Spark didn't stop about just uh, for monthly support or for some cash. No, it's about also uh, reach to language support, also language courses, including English, business English, and normal uh, uh, Turkish language as we are living in Turkey. Next slide, please. Uh, what I want just to say here, uh, actually, uh, refugees uh, started not uh, Syrian. Before Syrian was uh, Iraq, you know, before that, Afghani. And now, as we see, Ukrainian people just uh, uh, started their jury of refugee. So uh, the, uh, what I want to say here is not just uh, just have... Uh, such a uh, just uh, scholarship or just study at university, uh, but also uh, to have some skills, develop the skills, develop uh, language skills, uh, soft skills, hard skills. Uh, so to to be in the uh, in the market and to understand the local market and how it works and how we can enter the ecosystem. Uh, that's all I would uh, I wanted to say. Thank you for your uh, listening, and I am open for any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwar, uh, for joining us from Turkey. I'm afraid we don't really have time for questions uh, at this moment. Um, we still have two more case studies, and uh, this was supposedly to be the time of the end of this conference. I hope that everyone is joining us online, sticks with us, with us for a few more minutes to listen to the other examples, and that for those of you here in the room, you're also patient enough to wait for lunch until we're done. We, we would try to speed up with the next two case studies. Thank you, Yannick. I know you have to run uh, to get your train. Um, see you soon. Thank you for coming. Um, and thank you for presenting. And now I would like to go to my uh, colleague uh, in Germany, uh, Gudrun, um, who is presenting on the uh, Leadership for Africa uh, program. Gudrun. Um, you know the difficult, delicate situation we're in with time. I count on you in, to some extent, uh, helping me out without losing any of the uh, quality aspects you're about to present. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'll try. So please, uh, could the presenter give my slides? The first one. Yeah, next one, please. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> Fine, thank you. I'll do yeah, I would, <laughs> I would like to present shortly the Leadership for Africa program, which is a master's scholarship program for Africans, for nationals, we call them national normal graduates, let's say, and refugee uh, scholars, refugee graduates that are living in the countries we address with this, with this program. It's a scholarship program um, targeting East, West, and Central Africa. 
And we got from the German Federal Foreign Office up to 4 million per year, which means 70 scholarships every year uh, for people coming to Germany for doing a master's course in Germany. So the call is um, gone every year. And um, what is special to this program is we have a complementary program um, realized by a German university. Here we have uh, skill enhancement done regarding several topics. It's uh, civil society, etc., which is one pillar of, of this program, but as well um, competency enhancement for being fit for jobs afterwards. So um, what we call often soft skill training is done as well in, within this program. And it's called LEAD. The program is done by the University of Cologne. So we have what we have learned before from uh, the previous um, interviews. So it's really, we, we try to get this link, getting people well educated in Germany, coming to a German university, doing a master's degree in Germany, but making them even more um, competent for entering in job markets in Germany or in their home countries for really becoming someone who can make a difference in, in the society. Um, here you can see the link as well to the name of the program, Leadership for Africa. So we, we really have this um, aim of building leaders, of supporting young people for getting leaders wherever they want to be afterwards. Um, you can see here in the slide, I won't mention it in, in detail, uh, the numbers uh, we have so far for scholarship holders. What is important as well in this program is uh, that we work closely together with the UNHCR and this is crucial for being successful in this program because we see so many challenges. Uh, I was just wondering when they were talking about, yeah, doing internships as well, etc. We have so many issues which are complicated. Uh, they are worth dealing with and trying to find solutions. This is clear but it's not as easy so um, visa regulations for example that can be a hinderer for doing internships uh, in Germany or uh, all the the language issue I'm, I'm really glad that uh, the previous interview he talked about uh, the importance of language courses as well which is one element of our scholarships as well so the next slide please oh, this is the last one the double. <laughs> thank I you the slides I have just two slides for, uh, for, for making uh, some words. So the objectives we have within this program is uh, for the refugees, giving the possibility of legal pathways for migration. Uh, Manal, she, she talked about it already. So refugees from different African countries, they have the, the opportunity of coming to Germany as an international student. They have the same rights. They are entering here as one normal student, they are doing their study courses here, and when they just had their, their master's degree, they can try to get a job here in Germany. With the normal rules we have in Germany, with 18 months, they can stay just for finding a job. So this is really an alternative to all these disturbing pictures we can see about refugees coming uh, by boats, etc. So really, this is an, a crucial element, which is really a strong argument for this program in my mind. So we try to, to support the academic qualification, we, we try to enhance young African scholars for making their way. Um, with this we contribute to the education of a future generation of really of, of um, change makers. So this is uh, really a big element and so important and this can be for the development of their own countries, of their host countries in Africa if they would like to return or in Germany if they would like to stay. So, um, and as well, we have this element, what is some important element as well at DAD, um, enhancing the academic structures as well in the, in the um, host, in the home, home countries, yeah. So the, if people get the mere master or even if they would like to do a PhD afterwards and they can come back and just multiply what they've learned in their home countries in the, in the universities as well. So this is one uh, important element as well. So coming to best practices and challenges, um, yeah, what we have learned is it's really important uh, being strict in the selection procedure because we have the system that universities have to accept the, the scholars. We can't get, give a scholarship without involving the university in this process. So we need really high qualified people uh, that will be accepted by the universities for doing their master's degree here. Uh, what is needed as well, uh, especially for the refugees and for 
uh, Farosa, she will, Farosa, she will talk about it uh, in a while, I think, is um, the pre-departure phase, which is complicated for refugees. This is really something, uh, and here we are so grateful that UNHCR is at our side for helping in this. And the embassies as well, the German embassies who are really cooperating at a big level. This is great. Yeah, um, we have as one positive element... Um, Spouses and children can come with the scholarship holders, so it's really an option for, for the family. And um, yeah, challenges, let's talk about the challenges. We are aware that there is possible traumatization of, of participants, of scholarship holders. And yeah, we, we hope that we are in the position of dealing with this properly, but we, we are conscious about uh, this issue. And we try really to supervise closely, to monitor closely all processes. And we can count on the German universities. And this is great. They are really helping us. And, and well, Fadosa, you can talk about this in a moment, <laughs> about these elements as well. And um, yes, what is uh, the, the additional training is one really positive element. But I think you are all more interested in, in knowing more about Fadosa, who could a bit speak experiences. So, Fadosa, could you please tell us briefly about your personal and your study background? Um, hello, good uh, morning or good afternoon. Can you all hear me well? Yes. I'm Fadosa Muhammad Ali. I am a, a refugee student who grew up in Uganda, but my background, basically, I'm from Somalia. And uh, I grew up in Uganda. I fled from my country due to the wars. And uh, I, I came to Uganda when I was six years old. I studied there and uh, with the difficulty as a refugee student, um, with the help of UNHCR, I really want to thank UNHCR here because UNHCR is doing a lot for refugees, even though it's not really uh, the best a refugee could hope for, but it gives a hope. And uh, as a refugee a young girl from Somalia, I struggled to study her in Uganda. In a lot of hardships, the, the education system is not so easy. Uh, the costs also of living for a refugee student to uh, to reach up to university level is is really a dream come true for a lot of refugee students like me. And uh, I want to say and justify from here that uh, for a refugee student to to actually enroll in university is very hard. Very many uh, young refugee students manage to finish their high school, but they don't make it to the university level. So I thank uh, our DRD, the leadership for uh, uh, Africa program. It gave me an opportunity. I graduated from my university with my bachelor degree in public administration and uh, specializing in NGO management. And I had a hope of doing my master's, but I couldn't afford it. I finished in 2018, but I stayed home, for, I think, for two years, waiting or hoping to uh, start my master's program. I worked with an NGO called Norwegian Refugee Council, and uh, I was doing my part and my work that I always passionate about helping the refugees, the people like me, I know what life is. And I was also working as a volunteer with UNHCR, so I didn't know about the program. And I got to know it about the last day of the deadline. I, I, the program of, for Leadership for Africa really changed many students' lives, ex uh, including me and uh, refugee students like me. And on behalf of them, I want to thank the DRD and the, all the sponsors and the funding our organizations. The, this program has helped, especially the Africa, uh, Western Sahara and East African countries. It gave a lot of students the opportunity as a pioneer and the first students for refugees to come to Germany and uh, get this scholarship. I want to testify that the program is really doing great and is, is giving chances and a good quality of education with our connection and with the lead program by DID for the Leadership for Africa students. It's giving us to develop on our development plans and also to work with the SDG goals. Uh, me personally, I'm doing my master's in peace and conflict studies at the University of Otto von Gorich, Magdeburg, and it's giving me my goals, which are to at least make a, a peace and justice society for my people and for a lot of refugees 
I know what it's it's like to be a refugee and I've gone through the life of being a refugee and I've also got the chance to be educated to have a higher education. So I want to highlight what the importance of higher education here, the importance of higher education that a lot of students who have a lot of dreams, especially refugee students that really want to, to make it up to masters or PhD and make a project and do a lot for their community. And also in, uh, uh, the goal, which is to make a productive community and uh, a young generations to impact the, the, the world. Uh, so it is very important, especially I will highlight to put more focus on the African continent. Many um, uh, the Lead for Africa program actually impacted countries like Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, refugees also. And I will emphasize this program to continue because it's making a girl like me, a young girl like me, another refugee student to have come uh, accomplish their goal and have their dreams come true. I, I want to, uh, I'm in my second semester now, but I have high hopes of working and continuing with my hard work on work with UN and work with many impactful uh, organizations to make a change, especially in my country, Somalia. It has a lot of, uh, 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 it's a back, uh, it's a back leading or it's not on the way forward in terms of education and the stability there. So it's really helpful. I think we had questions or to answer about uh, or Gooden had to ask me, but uh, definitely that's a clear background of what I want to give to everyone and testify about what the Leadership for Africa program by the ID is doing and really impacting a lot of students uh, for example, like me. Thank, thank you, Fandosa. That was, you covered all my questions. <laughs> so okay. thank you very much. I don't know if Michael, if you have further questions, go ahead. But I think we had the whole picture and we are so, so happy thank you. having these thank fantastic you. scholars. <laughs> thank you, thank Gudrun you. and Fandosa. I, I actually would have many questions, but I don't think it's feasible to ask them now. Um, so maybe at some point we can meet in Germany and, and, and discuss uh, in a different setting and with a bit more time and to get to know each other. Yeah, sorry about, I just wanted to say like uh, for a refugee students that the, the journey was not so easy as Gooden has said about the documentations for bringing refugee students uh, to study in Germany. So I just want to ask you and HCR and the, the RD of course to put a lot of uh, uh, effort on that because up to now also settling in Germany here where I am now uh, to get legal documents for the refugee students is still hard and it's taking a lot of processes and uh, also coming from the host country that we were in and traveling was not so easy so I will just request that that could have okay, uh, emphasized on or changed you upon. Me on time. Yeah. Okay thank you very much for those uh, um, for, for this final uh, contribution. In the meantime, we use that time to, to bring Manal on stage again. Um, Manal, working for UNHCR, mentioned in the previous presentation by Gudrun uh, several times uh, as a partner for the Leadership for Africa program uh, in the African uh, region. Um, you notice we've, we've been going from Syria, from Ukraine to Africa, so the bottom line of this event really is high education in emergencies is a global topic. We need to look at emergencies everywhere mm. and see how high ed education can play a role. I'm very grateful that we have as a final speaker UNHCR here on stage um, to yeah, present a short case study uh, from their perspective as well. Great. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to stand up. I hope the camera will adjust. It does. There it goes. Um, so I'm grateful to all the partners who had students featured. Um, they should be the ones speaking here. I'm so glad that three of them were able to present. Um, I will absolutely save Mikael some time. I have a few key numbers that I want to present and have stick in your head, and I will not spend too much time on my case study, but I will flag that um, now that we've seen so many success stories and so many young people who have made their way, um, I want to look at one of the lesser known situations where um, the, the mountain is very steep indeed. So 15 by 30 is the first number that I want you to remember. 
A couple of years ago, we were reporting that only 1% of refugee youth were enrolled in higher education. Uh, two years ago, we reported 3%. Last year, we reported 5%. So we currently stand at 5% of young refugees worldwide are enrolled in higher education. That is compared to 39% in amongst the general non-refugee population. And again, 39% is an average, right? In many of the Nordic countries, um, many Nordic countries, for example, you're much higher than 39%. That's the average. We're going for 15% in the next eight years, 15% by 2030. Okay, next slide, please. I'm gonna go quick. Uh, you can go again. So here is the strategy. This is called the 15 by 30 roadmap. And again, what we're focusing on as, U as UNHCR in partnership with all of the organizations that are providing these bespoke programs for refugee scholars, what we're talking about are pathways to access education in the countries where they are. So of the four million odd refugee youth in the world, most of them will not access a complementary education pathway to Germany or to France or to the United States or Canada. Most of them will access their higher education where they are. And that is either through enrollment in national universities, which is why we support public universities. Enrollment in technical and vocational education and training colleges or institutions, same. These are often um, national institutions that are working directly with ministries of labor and planning, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's our scholarship right in the middle. Complementary education pathways we talked about. Gudrun is the expert, um, as is Helena, as are some of the other colleagues uh, working in, in uh, Canada and the United States. And then last is something called connected higher education. And this, as we all know, came to the fore in the context of COVID, where all of a sudden our digital, blended, and online learning modalities become much better. Um, we're no longer talking about doing Coursera here and there and you know, cobbling together a, deg a degree program. What we're talking about is fully fledged, high quality online learning. And so right now it remains a low pillar, but we have um, high expectations that these opportunities will expand. So if I could have the next slide. And the example that I wanted to look at is in South Sudan, right? So this is what a university classroom looks like in Jamjang area where my colleague was on mission last week. And um, we can see that connected higher education is very, very unlikely to be taking place here. Um, but that, that is where we see investments from partners like the EU and the Team Europe partners at country level. This is where investments in infrastructure can really make a difference. And the, the other thing I want you to remember is that it's not only for refugee students. These are not only refugee students. This is a mixed classroom. And so when you invest in TVET institution infrastructure, when you invest in national higher education, when you invest in connectivity, it benefits everyone. We're not only talking about refugees. Next slide. So we can go through this. Here's South Sudan, 3,000 uh, odd refugees, over 500,000 returnees. So again, we're talking about South Sudanese people who have come back to South Sudan and need to be able to access higher education in order to into reintegrate into their societies and contribute because they've been out for a long time. They've been outside for many years. They don't have those social networks. They do not have the financial stability to pay for higher education, et cetera. Um, we can go to the next slide. So here, the education situation analysis, and I would just point to what's, what's key here is that we've got seven public universities operating in, in all of South Sudan. Only 10 of 26 government TVET centers are operational. The others have been destroyed, neglected, falling apart, used for other things. Next slide. So then when we look across the five pillars, these are all of the ways that everyone, including powerful partners like the development actors on the ground who are sitting as part of the donor coordination groups, et cetera, where they can invest. Teacher capacity development, um, we're, we've got models where we're using um, teacher training modalities to allow DAFI students and other scholarship students to then return back into the public schools to teach younger children because we know there's a huge gap at secondary level completion. Um, we can look at, as I said, expanded connecting learning in settlement areas. Um, 
let's see, there's, for example, there's a Turkish bursary program coming out, starting to come out of South Sudan. It's the first ever complementary pathway program for students to be able to access education outside of South Sudan. Um, and then to some of the points earlier, which I think are incredibly important, accreditation and quality assurance at TVET institutions and market research to identify labor market gaps. And this applies both to TVET and to um, national enrollment part of which is the scholarship program where students are enrolled in public institutions. So I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm really happy to elaborate on any of these points. Um, let's do one more and let me see what it is. Next slide, please. So here's a snapshot of the Daffy Scholarship Program and I only want to use this to highlight a couple of things. One is that you can see here are the fields of studies that, that students are choosing. Now they are free to choose any course of study that they want. We don't have limitations to STEM or this or that. And yet you see what students are looking for is a pathway to work. And these top five fields of these, especially these three, are across all of our 57 DAFI countries. This is what students are looking for and where they're going. Um, so you, you can see there's 100 students in all of South Sudan who are benefiting from this scholarship program. It's an incredibly cost-effective program. We've got a 98% retention rate, and yet we don't have funds to enroll more than 100 students. So I think I mean, we can all see that there are ways to engage on policy, there's ways to engage through national development channels, and there are very simple ways to engage in supporting students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Manal. And apologies to the audience that we've packed this conference so full with interesting presentations. Um, it's really um, yeah, difficult to keep track of time because of the many things and the interesting partners and student stories that we, we, we were able to listen to. I found this uh, case studies very enriching. Now we are reaching the end of the conference, but uh, give me five more minutes because we have one special guest uh, from Turkey here who we promised during our last conference to say a few words about the role Turkey has been playing in uh, providing higher education in emergency support. Uh, the colleague, is name is, uh, her name is Perlin Eroglu. She works for YTB in, uh, as an assistant expert in the Department for International Students. Please, um, you have the floor for, yeah, you can stand there or come here as you wish. It's maybe better to come here. But be very concise. <laughs> it's always unfair towards the last speaker that uh, that time management is difficult. But uh, hello, everyone. As Michael introduced me, I work for the presidency for Turks Abroad and related communities in the uh, implementation of Turkey scholarships program, uh, which is a scholarship program open to all international students who would like to study in Turkey. And we receive around uh, 150,000 applications each year, and we grant 5,000 uh, scholarships each year to students from 100 countries at least. And since the beginning of the Syrian crisis that we have been conducting, conducting scholarship programs uh, with partnership with the UNHCR, with Duffy, with Spark. Uh, also, to, we are conducting scholarship programs with uh, Islamic Development Bank and a few uh, small NGOs from Yemen for Yemenis, Yemeni students. And um, we would like to share our experience here um, because that since the beginning of the Syrian crisis, there has been uh, multiple efforts in Turkey to continue their high, higher education in Turkey. And now, uh, since last year, there are 47,000 Syrian students studying in higher education institutions in Turkey in different levels. And since the beginning of the crisis, we have provided more than 5,000 uh, scholarships with the state uh, funds and also more than 3,000 scholarships with the joint scholarship programs that we have conducted with uh, UNHCR, with SPARC, and with HOPES. Um, and we have been continuing to, do, to implement these programs. Uh, and we are open to new initiatives each year that this year, the Afghanistan, we received more than three, 
30,000 applications for the scholarship to study in Turkey, and it is one of the countries that we provide the highest number of scholarships. And it, it is very important that we, we put this uh, experience that we gained through the Syrian crisis to other countries and continue to support. And during the Syrian crisis, the Turkish government put a lot of effort to make this happen through easing the way for transfers to Turkish universities and establishing programs in Arabic languages. And there was a fee waiver for Syrian students in Turkey. And I think that it's very important that I, I will go back to the very beginning and say that it is it not possible to invent the wheel every time that we have a, a very good program in place in Turkey and it's been working for uh, more than 10 years now. And um, we are always open to new partnerships and initiatives uh, for each emergency situation emerges. Emerge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Perlin, for, for being here um, with us, uh, joining us here in Brussels. It's much appreciated. I think we've wrapped it now with uh, the partners that we've uh, had on stage here during this conference. Let me try to sum up our event, Team Europe for uh, Higher Education in Emergencies. It's very difficult to sum up, maybe some key findings. Uh, I think we should, in terms of funding, really try to avoid crisis hopping. I think we need to have a long-term view on uh, what is happening in the world, integrate higher education in emergencies into a long-term perspective, see it as not only programs for refugees, but include the situation in higher education in the host countries, be innovative in acquiring more funding, scale up, um, work together, coordinate, be a team, maybe not Team Europe, but a global team or a team of those who want to work for higher education and peace. Um, and really come to grips with who, how can we coordinate the challenges that we have. We haven't provided all the answers. We have provided a lot of input and ideas. I hope that those who have answers or can act are either present in the room, listening online, or be told about this event. I think it was really helpful to listen to all the different dimensions, to all the different examples. I want to conclude by thanking the team behind the scenes, uh, Verena and Anna. Uh, a big round of applause for preparing this, um, this event. It's, uh, we worked in a hybrid format which, with almost no technical difficulties except for a colleague in Portugal not being able. So thank you to the tech support. You've done a wonderful job. And also, a big thank you to all uh, colleagues, Christian, Carsten, Gudrun, joining us either here in Brussels or online. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to the whole audience. And let's get some lunch now and continue the conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Goodbye.